This is Jocko Podcast number 65 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities or near necessities were P38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wrist watches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, chewing gum, candy, cigarettes, salt tablets, packets of Kool-Aid, lighters, matches, sewing kits, military payment certificates, sea rations, and two or three canteens of water. Together, these items weighed between 12 and 18 pounds, depending on a man's habits or rate of metabolism. Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches in heavy syrup over pound cake. Dave Jensen, who practiced field hygiene, carried a toothbrush, dental floss, and several hotel-sized bars of soap he'd stolen on R&R in Sydney, Australia. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tate K in mid-April. By necessity, and because it was SOP, they all carried steel helmets that weighed five pounds, including the liner and camouflage cover. They carried the standard fatigue jackets and trousers. Very few carried underwear. On their feet, they carried jungle boots, 2.1 pounds, and Dave Jensen carried three pairs of socks and a can of Dr. Scholl's foot powder as a precaution against trench foot. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried six or seven ounces of premium dope, which for him was a necessity. Mitchell Sanders, the RTO, carried condoms. Norman Bowker carried a diary. Rat Kylie carried comic books. Kiowa, a devout Baptist, carried an illustrated New Testament that had been presented to him by his father who taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. As a hedge against bad times, however, Kiowa also carried his grandmother's trust, distrust of the white man, and his grandfather's old hunting hatchet. Necessity dictated. Because the land was mined and booby-trapped, it was SOP for each man to carry a steel-centered nylon-covered flak jacket, which weighed 6.7 pounds, but which on hot days seemed much heavier. Because you could die so quickly, each man carried at least one large compress bandage, usually in the helmet band, for easy access. Because the nights were cold and because the monsoons were wet, Each carried a green plastic poncho that could be used as a raincoat or ground sheet or makeshift tent. With its quilted liner, the poncho weighed almost two pounds, but it was worth every ounce. In April, for instance, when Ted Lavender was shot, they used his poncho to wrap him up, then to carry him across the paddy, then to lift him onto the chopper that took him away. And that excerpt is from a book called The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien. And the book is about the Vietnam War, and it's actually a blend of nonfiction and fiction. And part of that blend comes from what he actually experienced for real as a soldier in Vietnam in 3rd Platoon Alpha Company, 5th Battalion, 46th Infantry Regiment. And incidentally, he was in the same division and the same area of operations where the My Lai Massacre took place. And then that reality is intermingled with his thoughts and ideas and stories that put together a unique perspective on war. But 
the book is considered fiction and I don't like to dig too deep on fictional books so I'm not gonna go too deep on this one but I was having a little conversation with my brother Leif Babin with whom I wrote a little book called Extreme Ownership and Leif and I were talking about the things that we carried and tonight we have the good fortune of having my brother Leif Babin here with us again today and I figured a good way to begin talking about what we carried was to kind of compare and contrast what we did carry with what men like Tim O'Brien carried in Vietnam Leif Babin my brother welcome to the show for the third time thanks for having me on good to be back on again and for those of you that don't know who Leif is if you haven't been listening or you this is if this is basically the first time you've ever listened to this podcast for some reason is if you're not gonna know who Leif is Leif was in the SEAL teams with me we were in the Battle of Ramadi together and when we both got out of the military I retired and Leif got out and We ended up working together. We have a little business called Echelon Front where we work with companies and teach leadership and management. And we wrote a little book, like I just said, called Extreme Ownership. And actually, if you want to know about Leif, well, you can read Extreme Ownership. You can listen to podcast number 11 and podcast number 34. Leif was the first guest. And here he is back again. So, Leif Babin. What did you carry? Talk to me about that compared to what these guys in Vietnam carried. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of differences, too. What do you think? Definitely. I mean, it brings back so many memories just thinking about all the stuff that we carried and uh, with us and uh, and the, the burden of, the, you know, just the heavy. You know, we used to joke about stuff, body armor back, you know, and the body armor is just biting into your traps after you've had it on for hours and hours of the helmets, just the vice down on your head. Uh, and obviously, we had to train and prepare so that we, we could, we could prepare to have those things on for hours and hours on end, and and be able to deal with that. And um, in fact, I remember you being the only guy in the universe that actually liked a, a certain type of headset that we were using because it actually crushed down on your skull, and you were like, "Bring it, good." <laughs> Everyone else is complaining about it. You were like, "You're like, I actually like this." Oh, that thing hurt my head. I would never have admitted it back then. But yeah, it hurt bad. It would squeeze your head in that awkward way. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> that was a that was a gnarly old headset. But a lot heavier because the body armor we're wearing. How much did how much did our body armor weigh? It was like seven pounds of plate, and you got a front and back plate, yep. and then you got the nine mil body armor, and you're that that right there is heavy. And then the funny thing is we were able to make our weapons a little bit lighter over time But then we've decked them all out with lasers and optics and everything so the weapons I bet you our, our weapons were actually heavier definitely and then like for me um, You know we, we had trained to carry those little 10 inch barreled uh, Our we have an m4 with a 10 inch barrel which we use for uh, close quarters combat, you know house clearance and and uh, As you know, that was like the primary weapon and we get to Ramadi. I was like hey I got to carry my 14 inch barrel which is longer and it's got an m203 a grenade launcher on it so you got a 40 millimeter grenade and that so it becomes comes a lot heavier uh, based on that I just I needed that to be able to throw some 40 mic mic down <laughs> now one of the things that I know was uh, I mean we all learn a lot in combat and actually Andy stump was just on and, and I know you're friends with him too but we were talking about the learning curve of how quickly you learn things and I know you you learn some pretty pretty solid and and rough lessons out of the gate going on some big patrols Right, right, right. When we got there, and it's specifically about what you carried. Absolutely. I mean, we had, you know, we had to focus so much on doing a, a roll up assault. We were loading up in vehicles, so you're not, you don't have to carry much on your person because uh, we're we're trained to, to to drive up in vehicles, and so we get to Ramadi, and of course we've done our patrols out in the desert, done that that training, and, and prepared for that. But we think we're going to go to Iraq, and we're going to we're going to drive in vehicles, and we get to Ramadi, and I mean, these IDs are so dangerous and killing people. So what do you do? You get out of the vehicle and you patrol, which means if you're going into an area and you got to carry everything on your back and you got to carry enough water and all the stuff you got to have for the next 24 or even 48 hours, 
it, it's a lot of stuff. And the, one of the the first patrols, uh, I've done a few patrols on kind of the outskirts of town, you know, but but that city center where it was Al Qaeda controlled battle space and U.S. troops were dying uh, an, almost every day in this horrible, violent place. We've been on the ground for uh, I think a couple weeks. Uh, in and uh, and we were teaming up with a marine unit from three eight marines third battalion eighth eighth marines outstanding group of Absolutely. warriors who've been on the ground for uh, a month or two prior to us getting there and they were these guys were in the thick of the fight and uh, they were they had adjusted their tactics and learned how to go out out there and and uh, and conduct these patrols and so we were teaming up with them to go into an area called Firecracker Circle as firecracker is in hey this is a happy place with fourth of july or firecracker is in massive bombs as in there's a 400 pound explosive in the road that's going to blow your vehicle yeah. 100 feet in the air and kill everybody Th that was that area of firecracker they did not as a matter of fact when we even even later than this when you were looking at doing operations in there and i remember sitting there with the marines going hey what's the qrf situation who can come in to get us and they were like hey look we're not coming in there with vehicles Unless they're like, hey, if, if it's an absolute worst case scenario and you got to get somebody Kazavac immediately, but if you get a guy get shot in the leg and you can stop the bleeding, you're going to wait till nighttime. You, they, they were adamant of, about not going in there because it was so bad. I mean, they patrolled in there all the time, which you're about to talk about, but nobody wanted to bring vehicles up in those streets. And actually, part of that reason is because just before we got there, they took a massive ID. The Marine Corps took a massive ID hit, and I think they lost four or five Marines in one shot. Just a, just a total travesty. Yeah, that was right as we were arriving. We right. were hearing the stories about that and reading the reports on it, and a uh, horrible, horrible deal. But that was, that was a great tactic that we learned from the Marines, it, it, which is... Listen, the bad guys, they want to blow you up in the streets. They're going to try to target your vehicles. They're going to try to ambush you. So when you're in a building in a sniper overwatch position and you're behind concrete walls, like stay in that position. Stay in that position un unless you have an urgent surgical casualty. You've got to get out right now or you're going to be overrun. O only in extreme situations. So we're not going to call in the QRF because they're going to blow up the vehicles. And that's what they want you to do. And, and they taught us some of those things that were uh, – that, that helped keep our guys alive and certainly helped us uh, perfect our our, uh, our our tactics, techniques, and procedures to be able to, to go deep into those areas and and, uh, and do some real damage to, to the enemy uh, and most of the time bring our guys home. So so speaking of going deep, how deep did you have to dig on that first patrol out with three eight Marines? So, so we're going into this area. I mean, we just, you know, these Marines have just lost guys and, and we were going in with Lima Company, outstanding group of warriors. Uh, and and you know we were excited to go in and work with them. So I've got a you know we got a about a squad of uh, of seals going in. We got some Iraqi soldiers, and we're going to team up and we're going to put in some mutually supporting sniper Overwatch positions uh, and remain you know uh, through through the we go in at nighttime. We'd remain through the day and we come out the next night. So I'm like, hey, I'm going in there. We're, we may be in there for 24 hours. It could even be longer if we get delayed. And you know what? This is a bad area. Nobody can come come get us out. So I'm loading out for World War III. And you know, my first time going to these areas, I mean, I'm packing hand grenades and extra mags. And, and you know, our typical loadout was two hand grenades. And I think I added a, I added like three or five extra hand grenades that I was bringing. So I put that in my bag. I'm bringing, I've got, ex, you know, my typical. I was like, actually laughing about this because we've done a lot of talk about World War I. And they had grenade battles, l l like trench to trench grenade battles. And I don't even think if I was going into a grenade battle where that was my primary weapon, I would have seven grenades like Leif was carrying right into Ramadi. Bring it. <laughs> it's awesome. So I'm getting, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready to get some. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, man, if, if we're getting overrun and we're loading up on it. So it's, it's like one more thing, one more thing, you know, extra mag here, extra mag there. So, you know, I've got... I've got those uh, extra hand grenades. I've got the extra uh, smoke grenades. I've got, uh, you know, I've got flashbang grenades. I've got, I've got, you know, four or five extra magazines in addition to like the seven magazines. You know, each of these are thirty round magazines. We carry. You must have had hundred pounds. You, crazy, at least hundred <laughs> pounds. Crazy amount of. And then of course I've got my. I'm carrying yeah. my forty mic mic. Right. right. So I've got forty millimeter grenades as well. And uh, and I was typically you know I'm I'm loading that out so so I've got a, a bandolier of twelve of those things I think I had six more on me, um, in, in in a pouch on, on my waist, uh, so literally I mean I'm rolling in like John J Rambo style, <laughs> ready to get some. So that, that seriously you know, as I'm sitting here thinking that must have been a hundred pounds worth of gear with your body armor, all those grenades, smoke grenades, forty Mike Mike, you must have had it at least. 
close to 100 pounds. I, I think I think easy because then you tack on water. You know that was the That's biggest right. limiting factor for us. I mean, you know, and, and you got the, the summertime heat over there is just just unbearable. You know, may hit 115, 120 degrees, and uh, so we're, here we are, remain over day. You're not going to drink the the water out of the faucet, you know, unless you want to be. Unless you want to be visiting, the, <laughs> making some frequent head calls and having some some uh, uh, dysentery for the next uh, next few days, uh, and, and what that's going to bring you. So, um, so you got to got to carry that water in. You know, we carry these liter and a half bottles that they had. I think I had probably ten or twelve of those bottles too. So I'm like, I don't want to run out of water, so I got to be a bunch more. You know, that even thought I needed. So it, ridiculous amount of weight that I'm carrying. And so we load up. I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time even just, you know, picking this bag up, putting it in. So we load up in our vehicles. We drive. We meet up with the Marines. We're loading up into their big uh, seven-ton trucks that they took in, and they put the troops in the back, these huge vehicles. And that, that was – they would kind of drive you on the outskirts of the bad areas on roads they'd cleared. Um, and hopefully you were protected, in the, you know, in those, in those vehicles from, from the armor. Then we unload – we loaded – and we unloaded from the vehicles once we got to a point. And just so everyone knows, these are, these are like Mad Max scenario vehicles. Vehicles that Gigantic. people that that people military guys had had put steel on the sides, you know, half inch steel on the sides to protect from rounds. Sandbags on the floor, you know, just put sandbags all over the floor. So it's not like when when, when he's talking about an armored vehicle, don't think of a tank or or a Bradley fighting vehicle. He's talking about a Mad Max scenario, big giant seven ton truck. It looks like a construction truck basically, but it's got big steel walls on it and now they put sandbags on the floor to prevent from IEDs and that's going to war in the fun way <laughs> straight straight out of the, the road warrior definitely um, and, and so we get dropped off from those those vehicles and of course we're kitting up and you know as soon as I'm putting this thing on I'm like man I'm carried I, I can't wait to drink this water you know uh, I can't wait to try to shoot some of these rounds you know get get rid of some of this weight because I realize like it's, it's crazy it's a crazy man of course you're like you know you don't want to run out of ammo but you also you know, you, you can't if you can't move, then right. then it becomes even more dangerous. So we start to patrol, and we're moving in the area, and 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 the Marines who'd, who'd spent uh, time on the ground, as I talked about. I mean, their their method of patrol because there were a lot of enemy snipers out there, and even though it's nighttime, you know, there's still some street lights and things like that. So their meth- method of patrol is two man shooter pairs, and they're, those guys got each other's backs. So you got two guys covering two different directions, and they're holding on a on a on a street corner, and. And then they're waiting for the, the next a shooter pair that's up to the next block from them, and they sprint all out, mad dash sprint as fast as you can go, as fast as you can run from one corner to the next corner. So it's so it's, it's like a cover and move, but yards. it's cover and sprint as exactly. hard as you can. And some of those blocks maybe it's fifty yards, some of them it's a hundred yards, but you know, and this is how they patrol into the city. So it's it is your, your, your sprint hold, sprint hold, sprint hold, and you know. A few blocks are going into that, and we're kind of moving around the city and in misdirection. It's like, man, I am smoked. I'm having so a hard time keeping up. And, and just my hats, these these young Marines that are just getting after it, carrying heavy, heavy equipment and gear, and the the radio men and the guy carrying his you know his forty mic mic, and they're of course they're carrying the two uh, two forty Bravo machine gun, which is a a belt fit machine gun that, that was much heavier than what what uh, our our you know Mark forty eights lighter machine guns were uh, for for our medium machine guns, but um, these guys were just awesome, just awesome trying to you know trying to uh, work with them. But I am I am having one hell of a time trying to keep up with these guys. So so, so what does that do to your uh, what does that do to your leadership capability when you when you're well here I'm, I'm tired <laughs> here I am supposed to be in charge of this thing. So I'm in charge of this. I'm in charge of my guys. You know, we got a squad of eight of our guys, eight SEALs, and, and a, you know, a dozen Iraqi soldiers. So, and I'm supposed to be in charge. I'm supposed to be thinking about the bigger picture and, and be able to detach and all the things that we talk about, sitting back and thinking about, you know, uh, what's going on, you know, a half mile up the road and, and making, you know, uh, radio calls back to the, the tactical operations center and talking to you and telling you where we are and what, what's going on. And I can't. I'm I'm focused at this point on putting one foot in front of the other, just head down, one foot in front of the other, and just try to keep up. You know, and here I am, the guy just having a hard time keeping up, and it was it was humbling, humbling experience for me. Here I am, a, a, a seal, a team guy, thinking I'm in shape, 
And, uh, you know, and I'm in an area where, you know, I'm not acclimatized to this kind of brutal heat. Even at nighttime, it's 95 degrees outside, you know, and there's no wind. No wind. No wind. And, and you think, oh, it's a dry heat in the desert. No. <laughs> the river's like, you know, just. Yeah, it's not a dry heat. Yeah, not, not in Ramadi, it's not a dry heat. Yeah, we were half, you know, half mile off the river. So it's, it's, it's humid along, yeah. along the river. So uh, it, was, it was horrible. And I was realizing like this. I got my ass kicked. I mean, it was, by the time we got back from that, it was, I, I knew I was going into a heavy, like heat exhaust. Like I was, I was hitting the, like the Ooh. heat exhaustion point where it was like, this is rough. This is rough. And stuff. that's the thing that's scary about heat exhaustion scenarios is it's like a cliff you're walking off of and when you're getting close to the cliff and when you go off of it, it's not like you say, okay, let me get a sip of water. No, you're in big trouble. You got guys carrying you now because you, you know, if you get heat stroke or heat exhaustion, it's a bad, bad situation. And it doesn't matter how tough you are. No. You're not going to be able to power through that, right? Physically. Uh, it, it, and so that's what, you know, that's a nightmare scenario for me that here I am the leader. And yet if I can't keep up, if someone has to carry me, right, that was, uh, that was just going to be a horrific disaster. So, you know, we, we went through that operation. We were out there for, uh, you know, uh, remained throughout the course of the, 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 the day, daylight. We got shot at. We shot at some bad guys. And, uh, and then we came out, you know, the, the next night. And uh, I got back from that. I was were like, you aggressively returning fire to get uh, rid of some of those rounds? We definitely aggressively <laughs> returned fire. Unfortunately, didn't get a chance to throw any of the hand grenades, uh, which was a, a real bummer. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was a real rude awakening for me. Just being humble by that experience to come back and think, I'm carrying way too much stuff. I can't, you know, it's, it's sure. I don't want to run out of ammo, you know, and, and, but, but how much more dangerous is it for me to be carrying so much stuff that I can't even keep up on a patrol? I can't move fast when I need to. And if bad guys start shooting at us, I can't get my guys off the street, you know, or I can't move, run across the street or run up the stairs. And, and, and so I recognize right away, like I've got to, I got to pare this down and I got to carry just the essential stuff and maybe a couple of contingency plans, like right? maybe I got one extra grenade in my in my backpack, um, and maybe I don't even need that. You know, um, what do I really absolutely need? You know, don't want to run out of water out there, so maybe I got one extra bottle. Don't need four. You know, um, with me, and and that enabled me like to to recognize that I've I've got to carry only the essential stuff because you can absolutely get overwhelmed. Um, and part of that too, if you you know, we were training, we trained at land warfare at the time, you know, it was the attitude was we do land warfare in the SEAL teams. So we don't, we don't wear helmet and body armor for land warfare. So we'll go out and patrol across the desert and do that stuff. We wear helmet body armor when we do CQC close quarters combat in the, in the kill house. And, you know, here we are in an urban environment, like gotta, gotta be able to do both. I'm foot patrolling and then we're clearing houses. Yeah. So gotta have that stuff. Uh, and, and you just recognize how you just cannot carry all that stuff with you. So that was the rude awakening for me. And the other piece of that was physical training. You know, here I was thinking I'm in shape. I'm a team guy, you know, uh, we train hard, we push the envelope and yet I am not in good enough shape to be able to to perform at the level I need to in this kind of heat, in this kind of environment. You know, and after that, you know, you would see, not, it was a lesson not just me learn, but I, I saw so many Everybody. of us. It, you know, it, it, to you, Bruiser, you showed up, if you showed up at like noon uh, at the heat of the day, um, you'd see guys out doing tire flips, doing, right. doing you know, sprints, running, uh, working out to get acclimatized, to be ready for those, those worst case scenarios. And we recognized that we thought we were good and we had to step it up to, to an even I actually even took game. one of those workouts and I would do it at, at, at Victory MMA Training Fighters, but the workout was, it was uh, a, a dummy carry, because we had a big uh, old heavy bag, so it was a dummy carry, carry it down and back, sprint as hard as you can then grab the tire it was a tire pull down and back and then a sprint down and back and what that was simulating was like okay you might have to pick up a guy and carry him down or carry him somewhere then you you also might have to grab a guy and drag him and then you might just have to sprint but that was we do that like you said we do that stuff at high noon cuz cuz like you said everyone wanted to be acclimated for the worst case scenario and that was something we saw over and over again even the I, by the way I remember you running those I remember you running Dean through that uh <laughs> <laughs> do that training. It was brutal. He I was like that, that too like, much, did he? That's rough. That's yeah. a rough thing. Uh, good training. Awesome training. Yeah. You know, it prepare yeah. you for those worst case scenarios. But we, it was humbling. And we'd see, you know, we'd have great team guys, brothers who showed up, you know, in Ramadi and want to go out on a patrol with us. Uh, guys who we knew were incredibly fit, great athletes, kept themselves in shape. Um, these certainly weren't the guys that let themselves go. And we take them out on a patrol and like, 
they'd be falling back. You know, they'd be having a hard time keeping up. They, they'd have they had to learn that same lesson that I learned, uh, and and then you'd see them out there getting after it, right? like training and pushing the envelope. Uh, and I think that was a lesson that uh, you know we learned some great tactics from the Marines, and I also got it was uh, my hats off for those young Marines that were that were getting out there in the thick of it. They taught me some some uh, some great lessons there that enabled us to go forward and and uh, really uh, push. You know, push the envelope, going deep in areas that nobody could get into, um, and setting up the sniper overwatches and, and helping protect the, the soldiers and Marines that were building those combat outposts. Uh, but ha- we had to be physically fit, and we had to carry only the essential gear uh, that we needed. And you know what's interesting? I'm sitting over here because we, you know, obviously we're in a business consulting business, but same thing that we'll see with businesses when they want to they want to do the same thing they want to build their infrastructure so much that they can handle any scenario that's going to happen so they're going to hire three more people in case of this and they'll hire six more people for that and they'll hire four more people for that for that contingency right it's like you saying well i might run out of magazine so i'm going to put five more in my backpack and i might throw these four grenades so i need three more and next thing you know these companies they're so overburdened with with overhead and with cost structure that the same thing happens what happens they lose their ability to maneuver and so it's the same thing you take that combat principle of carry what you need think about it and don't carry too much and you apply that to the business world hey, if you don't need to bring that extra person on board and you can get away with a contractor for a little while or you can pay somebody some overtime do that until you have to make that decision and you'll know so that's something you actually taught me uh, in in Ramadi. You know, we uh, you you can't you had been in Baghdad and had those good those, the experiences of these capture kill raids and and uh, it, it always seemed like we're we're going in this house. We don't know what's in that house. We know we believe a bad guy to be there and maybe he has some people. So so I'm going to put 25 assaulters in that house, and you know I'm going to put as many people as I can. And then you're like, hey Leif, I don't think you need that many people. And initially I was like, that's crazy. Why would I not want to take them all? <laughs> and then you recognize like. 25 people in the house it, there's a lot more mayhem there's a lot more chaos there's people bumping yeah. into each other and you're like yeah maybe maybe 14 guys is all i need yeah. you know for this particular target and guess what else yeah. um when you're on this target where's the biggest threat the biggest threat actually oftentimes isn't in the building you're taking down because you're doing that aggressively you have a good force the the harder threat to cut you know where the threat is a building is you know 480 square feet or 1400 square feet you know how big that it's a it's a it's a finite area whereas when you're in the street 360 degrees that threats there so where do you actually need people to cover a, a threat that you don't know and don't understand you need them in the streets that's where you need them and that's where we always went heavy on the streets and the assault team is a smaller package and plus it's very easy and very controlled to be able to say, Jocko, I need four more guys in here. Boom, you got them. Super easy. Doing the opposite. Hey, send four guys out in the street. We don't know where, but send guys out. It's it's totally. It's much more hard. It's much harder to do that because it's a much less controlled situation out in the streets. And I think for leaders, that planning piece, right, to think about where is that contingency. What what are the likely contingencies that may happen? Uh, so yeah, keep that essential personnel, essential resources, uh, and focus. You, you can't plan for every contingency, and if you do, you're going to overwhelm your team, uh, and and it's gonna it's gonna cause more problems trying trying to solve every contingency than uh, than it wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, yeah. All right, that's that's good stuff. You know what I'm gonna do? Go back to the book right now. Here we go. They were called legs or grunts to carry something was to hump it as when lieutenant Jimmy Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps almost everyone humped photographs in his wallet lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha as a first lieutenant and platoon leader Jimmy Cross carried a compass map code books binoculars and a 45 caliber pistol that weighed 2.9 pounds fully loaded he carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men as an RTO Mitchell Sanders carried the PRC 25 radio a killer 26 pounds with its battery 
As a medic, Rat Kylie carried a canvas satchel filled with morphine and plasma and malaria tablets and surgical tape and comic books and all the things a medic must carry, including M&Ms for especially bad wounds for a total weight of nearly 18 pounds. As a big man, therefore a machine gunner, Henry Dob- Dobbins carried the M60, which weighed 23 pounds unloaded, but which was almost always loaded. In addition, Dobbins carried between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition draped in belts across his chest and shoulders. They all carried ghosts. When dark came, they would move out single file across the meadows and paddies to their ambush coordinates where they would quietly set up the claymores and lie down and spend the night waiting. In that section, when I was reading that, clearly this is very similar to the operations that you conducted a ton of, which was, you know, they're calling them ambushes here and we called them sniper overwatches. But the idea, you know, the idea for those of what was happening is very, very similar. You know, (laughs) you guys are patrolling out to a location just like you talked about and setting up for remain over day or for the night. How did you feel like, you know, you kind of talked about it, but did you feel like you were ready for that stuff? And, you know, a lot of times, like you said, we, we were, we were, we trained to drive a lot and we ended up walking so much because of the IED threat. How did you man, man, how did you manage that once you got on the ground? Well, I, I think, thank God we had actually trained and, and, you know, it's been a part of the SEAL team since Vietnam, you know, going out in the Southern California desert and training and, you know, land warfare, you know, is that, that awesome block where you go out and learn how to patrol, uh, which we've talked, you know, you talked a lot about in the podcast and certainly we talk about with Echelon Front, you know, where it's man camp out in the Southern California desert in this rugged environment with just sharp rocks and, and yeah. cactus with spines and rattlesnakes. And so, so. Real quick, everybody in the world, when they hear the term Southern California, they think of Baywatch, right? Yeah. They think of Baywatch. We ain't talking about Baywatch. So when you go east from the coast in Southern California, you enter a place, places that have names like Death Valley, right? Those are the kind of areas we're talking about. We're not talking about SoCal, Baywatch. (laughs) We're talking about inland in the, in the, Deserts the hard deserts of California and it's where it's one of the primary places where we train for for combat and it is I always used to say that our desert training facility is where men become frogmen <laughs> Even though there's no water out no there. Doubt. <laughs> it's where men become frogmen because it'll test you no doubt And I you know, thank God that we we get tested like that and that put you know the, that kind of training um, is uh, is something that's that's kept seals alive on the battlefield and enabled us to to accomplish some some great things for a long time. And I remember that first shakeout patrol. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. The land warfare instructors that we're fired up to get out in the desert to train, get our land warfare on, dial it in, uh, our procedures, and learn how to work together as a team and patrol. And we show up to the camp. It was funny because. Generally, I mean, I'm not going to say that you have this immense trust with the cadre, but like, you know, we're kind of friends with all these guys. We know them. And so they did a really good job of, of suckering us in on that on that first patrol because they said, hey, we're just going to send you guys out on a little shakeout patrol tonight. And so a shakeout patrol in the SEAL teams means you're going to put your gear on. You want to see how everything rides on your body. You want to make sure that it's comfortable. You want to make sure that there's no, you know, tags that are wearing on you or anything like that. That's just a shake up. Get your little hand signals. Make sure we're all good to go. Get to know each other a little bit. It's just like a little. It's it's basically like a little walk, like like a little walk. I mean, you, f- you think it's probably going to take a shake up patrol? Should probably take you know hour, maybe two hours at the most. We're just going to be, you know, kind of relaxed mode, doing a little shake up patrol. So and that, that was the setup. And it's administrative, right? So you're like, hey, let's work on this, that's that. So it's it's not like you're you're in the game acting like you're in enemy territory the whole time and it's you know, so you're kind of talking with instructors and figuring things out. So yeah, so they're like, Oh yeah, just 
the, the land warfare crowd are like, yeah, just, just a little shakeout patrol, no big deal. So we're just showing up. You know, no one's got their so, – I know I didn't have my gear situation. I, I grabbed some stuff that I'd had from advanced training, uh, what we call SQT, so qualification training, from, from like two years before that. Um, and uh, I had these two canteens that had been filled with water um, in that gear. And I don't think I'd emptied that water in like two years. So there's probably a little algae growth and some nastiness <laughs> going on in these canteens. So I just like throw it, okay, we'll shake out patrol. You know, and then we were rushed because they were, try, they were, they were like, hey, we got to get this going. We got to get this going. So we, we arrived, you know, guys are trying to get settled. And they're like, hey, get, you know, get your gear on. Let's get over there. It's, it's, so, so we throw our gear on and I throw on that gear with the, those canteens, with the, you know, this, this two-year-old water in it. And, we're, uh, and we're, we go, we take off on the patrol. And what we didn't know was that uh, this shakeout patrol was uh, was a was a man test. It was a man <laughs> test. And what what uh, a word we like to use in the SEAL team is called the mud suck, which is basically a sucker punch, right? They they put together a patrol that was it took hours and hours. Well, it took the whole night. The whole it took night. the whole cycle of darkness. The whole night. And and no one had. I mean, s- several guys didn't have any water. I remember <laughs> I remember Ryan Job had like no water at all. Yeah. And uh, I remember him like, you know, just struggling. I was like, "Hey, hey, uh, sir, do you have do you have some water?" <laughs> <laughs> and I actually came up, I came up to you, I yeah. think, right? Because it was like, you said no one had water, and actually, I had water. <laughs> I had water. I was going on it. To me, it was like shakeout patrol. Of course, even though I was like, "Oh, it's kind of administrative." Of course, in my mind, I'm like, "Hey, it's a shakeout patrol," but I'm doing everything the way I would do it normally because I'm super hardcore. So I. Got all my stuff the way it's supposed to and and also I had the advantage of having done a lot of these trips in my time So for me, I didn't it wasn't trying anything new. It wasn't a shakeout patrol for me It was just a patrol Mm. But yeah, I went got good water in my canteens my camelback and I was all good to go and I was ready for this and because discipline equals freedom you were uh, you were, you had the freedom to go out and execute yeah. with your water. Uh, meanwhile, I'm carrying these canteens that I know like I did you say I like your first sip you spit it yeah, out. I, I actually I actually I got so thirsty right <laughs> that finally I was like I, I gotta I gotta drink something and uh, so I I, I, <laughs> I pull one of these canteens out. Again, you know, it's just nasty. Algae. I open it up. I like smell it. I was like, man, it smells like a, it smells like a fish aquarium, you know. <laughs> and I like just, I, but I'm at this point, I'm desperate, right? I'm desperate. Like two or three, four hours into this thing, everyone sweat. So I was like, I, I take a big sip of this thing, and it just immediately projectile vomit that up, uh, that stuff back up. Um, and uh, I, I, I think I, I gave one of those canteens to to, to Ryan because he's so he was just desperate. But I asked you for water. How'd that work? Didn't I ask you for yeah, water? You I, was like, you I was like, hey, uh, Jocko, do you have any water? And I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, yes, I do. And you said, can, guy, can you? Is your voice was scratching me the whole nine yards. You were dehydrated. You're like, can you give some of that to Ryan? He's, he didn't bring any water. And I said something along the not lines of, well, firstly, I said, no, you can't have any of my water. If, I, if you want water, you must hump it in. You don't. I don't hump in your water, and I'm not humping in Ryan's water. That doesn't work this way. <laughs> you bring in your own water. And then I, th- I think I said, like, if he's going to die, I will give you some water. If he's not going to die, you will get nothing. <laughs> uh, and, and he got nothing. So, And it, just so everybody understands, like, it is it is pretty – if you can't carry your own stuff in, right, it's, yeah. it's pretty taboo, t- taboo to have to have to, like – Depend on somebody else and right? no kidding at that point. We didn't actually know I Didn't know how long we were gonna be f- in the field for I mean we yeah, we they were keeping us in the dark They didn't tell they us, us what was going on and yeah. they did a really good job of They brought us into the hill into the hills of Southern California where you're gonna be going up and down terrain And the terrain is uneven and they did this whole link up drill So it wasn't like we, we were just blindly walking it was link up from starting with a f- Swim pairs and then fire team link up and then squad link up and then platoon link up and Yeah, so we the the future was very unknown at this time <laughs> So I I wasn't you know thinking hey, I'll just give a bunch of my water away because Yeah, you give all your water away and, then, yeah. and you got nothing and then you're struggling to keep up too So it's it's it was a bad situation and it was it Am was I an asshole I think I might just have like peaked a little well, bit I, at least getting in the zone a little bit <laughs> it, it was it was definitely borderline but look i i think the reality was uh you were helping reinforce the lesson that uh, yes. you got to have your gear squared away yeah. you got to be ready and you, you got to be ready for a contingency like that 
because that happened all the time to us. You know, we'll be like, hey, this is going to be, you know, obviously we're in Ramadi and we're like, hey, this will be a 24 hour operation. Like, no, now it's a 48 hour operation. Yeah. Now it turns into a 72 hour operation. We're going to, we're going to stay here longer than we thought. So you got to have, you, you got to be squared away. You got to be thinking about that. And, you know, thank God we had uh, such awesome, amazing leaders like, like Tony Afratti, mm-hmm. you know, that who's been on this podcast and that people love. And Which is why we so. can say his name because otherwise we'd name off all the other. D- Guys that were out there good, you know, the LPOs that getting after it, the E5 mafia in there running things. So, yeah, it's a, it's the whole crew. And that's exactly. And just leaders at every level that were stepping up, leading their fire teams, leading their squad. Uh, and I think that was it. Thank God. I, I appreciate as, 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 as much as that sucked uh, and as much as people were complaining about that at the time, um, those kind of training scenarios where we didn't see it coming and it was a lot harder than we thought it was going to be. It got us ready. You know, to to uh, for those those long range patrols in Ramadi, and when we got there, like you said, we thought we all thought we were gonna drive, and they were like, "Well, we can't drive, man. That's the best way to get killed if you want to try to drive into some of these areas. So park your vehicles and walk in on foot." Uh, and again, we, we, you know, we learned we only had to carry the essential stuff, but we also knew we had to carry some firepower too, because one of the things that we did in Ramadi was. You know, I think oftentimes special operators can get a little spoiled where, you know, if you're going out on a mission and it's got some higher profile and you've got, you know, you've got aircraft supporting you and, and, you know, you're going to have all this, uh, you've got close air support set up where it's, it's just dedicated to you, you know, and here we are, we're, we're, you know, we, we had 40 SEALs in Tasking and Bruiser, so I'm leading a 16 man SEAL platoon and maybe a couple other augments, um, you know, with SEALs and, and our EOD bomb disposal technicians and Iraqi soldiers. And we're just one tiny unit out of 5,600 troops, that Marines and soldiers of the, of the 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division Brigade Combat Team. So um, there isn't dedicated aircraft to us. You know, there isn't a QRF that's a quick reaction force that's dedicated just to us to come out. Yeah, because on top of so, you, you, you know, we had our unit. And just because you were out with your platoon in a firefight, you were not the only game in town at that time there would be three or four other units somewhere else on the battlefield that were in a firefight maybe worse maybe not as bad but there was there was always someone that's calling the qrf or that needs air support so it was exactly like you're saying we we weren't at the top of some food chain we were just in the in the food chain and had to learn how to mitigate that stuff by so so you know that massive loadout that you took and you were heavy. You st- it's not like you said, okay, I'm not going to have to carry this stuff anymore. You still had to to bring it. We, we had to make sure that uh, that we carried our own firepower into those areas. When in an area where we knew that the tanks may have a hard time getting in there to us, even if even if in the, the emergency scenario, and we didn't want to be overrun. You know, 50 enemy fighters trying to overrun our position, and we only got you know eight or ten or 12, 12 guys in this position with you know some Iraqi soldiers who were pretty much worthless when it came to uh, to beating back an enemy attack. Uh, uh, like that so um, and, we, and and by the way there were many positions small positions small you know, sniper size elements that were overrun and dis- I know before we showed up there was an element that disappeared and they didn't they, they found their bodies months later but you know same thing it was a smaller element of I don't know it was five or six guys in a, in a sniper type element they got overrun they didn't know no one knew what happened to them and it, ha- it happened to large Fortified positions as well if you remember some of the checkpoints that were well fortified and built up and they got completely overrun by 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 moosh and so yeah, you might driving a big thousand pound VBID truck bomb into their position horrible We had to carry all kinds of that that firepower with us We had to carry it on our back So the belt fed machine guns the guys carrying those those uh, the machine guns that were gonna beat back enemy attacks Um, Carl Gustav was was a, uh, our shoulder fired it's a recoilless 84 millimeter recoilless rifle that we use um, and it's heavy super heavy um, it's great against enemy tanks uh, the the Mouge didn't have any tanks so um, it was uh, probably a lot heavier than what we needed uh, our uh, our leading petty officer would just man up BTF and carry that thing in um, and he figured out pretty quick though that I think the first time he tried to carry it in he's uh, he w- they were on a long range foot patrol and, and going into an area that was this area was a rural area a little bit outside the city and so now you know we were used to patrolling the city streets in this rural area uh, MC1 that was kind of out east of, of Ramadi now you're talking about patrolling in through farm fields 
and flooded flooded areas where you might be an ankle or knee deep mud. It looked and like Vietnam. It looked, it looked like, like Vietnam. every yeah. every war movie that you see about Vietnam. In fact, we used to call it Viet Ram. Viet Ram. <laughs> that's what we we call it. And it was it was it was just like that. I mean, I, my first patrol that I went on out there, we we're literally wading through irrigated fields through yep. mud and 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 wading through canals because there's all these little canals that are coming off the river to, to irrigate the fields and and there was some marines supporting us so we had we had a huey helicopter and a cobra gunship which are vietnam air platforms yes and i was like man am i in iraq right now or <laughs> vietnam this is crazy there was there were people out tilling the the fields with like a like an ox yeah i mean it looked like something straight out of it was it was vietnam. actually crazy out there in mc1 yeah. how much it looked like vietnam it was nuts. It was nuts, <laughs> and it was not anything that we'd expected to do. Certainly, so we just had to prepare for that contingency and and uh, and figure out a way to you know to operate in that environment. Um, and but but you know our LPO is carrying that you know carrying that big man uh, rocket. Uh, and, but he recognized right away. Like initially, he tried to carry some rounds in his backpack, and you know each of the. I, mean, I don't even know what this thing weighs, but it's it's got to be what. It's got to be. I think the weapon itself probably weighs. 25 pounds. 25 pounds and each of the rounds because it got to weigh 10, rounds are 10 or 12 pounds yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, maybe 15 pounds i don't know but so when you put that thing when you load that thing uh initially carried it in loaded and then put around his backpack and it just weighed him down he couldn't do it so uh it, you know it was hard, hard keeping up so he recognized i'm going to carry it empty i'll carry it in my hand i'll put one round in my backpack that i can use and then we'll put uh, another I, I always carried around for, for in, in my in my rucksack as well, you know, that I could hand off to those gunners if they needed it. Uh, but that gave us some firepower to be able to, to beat back an enemy attack, and we had to carry that stuff in on ourselves. So it just, it took, you know, one or two guys that could man up and, and do that, and our LPO was, was the guy to BTF with that. Yeah, and you said if you needed, and you needed a lot because, um, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but you guys shot the six month loadout of Carl Gustav rounds in about a week and a half. <laughs> so, and then we had to borrow a bunch from the Rangers, and we actually shot their loadout too. So it was awesome. We actually got the cool air burst, air yeah. burst rounds from the yeah. Rangers, which was awesome. Yeah, those are those are effective. <laughs> what does that mean? Air burst. Air burst means that uh, it explodes over the top of. So bad guys are shooting at you from a rooftop, right? Like, and and they're hiding behind a wall. Um, you could like, you could you can you can determine like how far they are and set a timer on there so it explodes over the top of oh, them. Oh, oh, oh. Damn. Uh, okay. So it's pretty devastating. It's pretty yeah. awesome. We like devastating. Yeah, man. T. T. Blizzard got after it with some Carl G. rounds. Yeah, that's kind of advanced, though. You know, like technology-wise, where you can set how far you want it to. It is advanced. It throws throws another kind of twist into you know. You got yeah, dang. but it's uh, it's good to go. I didn't know. I didn't know it was like that. Well, they've actually had airburst rounds for a really long time. Well, we don't hear about them though. Yeah, you know what I mean. I know it's a little advanced in the civilian sector. I guess. <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> it's pretty dope though. That's good stuff. All right, hey, I'm going to go back to the book here. Taking turns, they carried the big PRC-77 Scrambler radio. And interestingly, if you remember when Andy Stumpf was just on and we were talking about being new guys in the SEAL teams in the 90s, mm. we were still carrying the PRC-77 in our training operations, which is pretty crazy. We carried it in buds. There that you was, go. That we did, did it for our, our comp shots in buds. Taking turns, they carried the big PRC-77 Scrambler radio, which weighed 30 pounds with its battery. They shared the weight of memory. They took up what others could no longer bear. Often, they carried each other, the wounded or weak. They carried infections. They carried chess sets, basketballs, Vietnamese English dictionaries, insignias of rank, bronze stars and purple hearts, plastic cards imprinted with the code of conduct. They carried diseases, among them malaria and dysentery. They carried lice and ringworm and leeches and paddy algae and various rots and molds. They carried the land itself, Vietnam, the place, the soil a powdery orange-red dust that covered their boots and fatigues and faces. They carried the sky, the whole atmosphere. They carried it, the humidity, the monsoons, the stink of fungus and decay, all of it. They carried gravity.
what a great description. I mean, that's just, and that's why, like I said, even though this book is, you know, part fiction and in a blend of truth and fiction, that clearly is written by someone that was on the ground in Vietnam. And there's a lot of similarities between that environment and the land itself and the atmosphere in Ramadi. What do you think of when you think of the atmosphere and the land in Ramadi? Just listen to that a minute. It just takes me right, right back there. Uh, you know, to oh, some no one could have been able to write that unless they'd been there. You know, unless they'd been a part of that, um, and uh, you know what that was like uh, for us. And the first thing I remember about about being in Ramadi is just the the stench. You know, it was there's something. There was always the stench of something burning. Always the stench of something burning, and whether it was civilians burning trash because there's no trash pickup in this total war zone city, and you see these giant trash piles everywhere, and so, certainly there was the stench of that garbage all the time, um, and uh, but so they'd be burning trash, and a lot of the burning was a burning vehicle in the street that got ID, you know, that was a an explosion that went off, that was that was a building that was on fire because the tanks hit it with a main gun round, um, and. Uh, you know, or, or or the bad guys had driven a truck bomb into a you know, position and just just smoke in the air. And uh, I remember that that stench of burning, and I remember the stench of the trash, the garbage, uh, and and sewage, raw sewage. That was always a, a stench as well, and uh, that kind of takes me back there. And the kind of haze in the air that you get, that kind of Iraqi haze. It's kind of like uh, the, all those smells that you talk about. It's kind of like war is hanging in the air because it's fire yeah. and it's gunpowder and it's trash and it's a, it's like that smell is war in my mind. If I smelled that smell, I'd think we we're at war right now. That uh, sometimes if uh, uh, you know, sometimes you'll smell a similar smell or things like that. It'll just kind of take me right back to to, to being in that environment. Um, yeah, those the the stench I think is is uh, of that, but it was it was also a stench that we loved as well because you know this is what we dreamed about our whole life and i remember tony and i talking about that you know just just um this is where we wanted to be right i mean every people in t bruiser our our boys were ready to get after it and be a part of that and and uh you know where else we want to want to be that in that incredibly difficult environment you know this most dangerous battlefield and uh, we we wanted to be a part of that. So it was that it was, it stunk, but it was it was it was a good. Bro, I remember the first stage. the first big operation we did in the Mulab, and I'm rolling in there, and it's it's dark, and we kind of turn this main corner, and as soon as we turn this main corner, there's there's tires in the street on fire, and you know, so you, you, I could smell it before, but I was like, what is that? Well, am I smelling burning tires? And sure enough, we turn the corner and it, it screws up your night vision goggles because now they're getting all bled out by the bright light. And and then as the sun's coming up a little bit, you see the dark smoke. And I remember that to me, I don't know why, but that to me was the switch in my mind because there's that was the first, because my first big operation, that was the first thing that I said to myself, the, the, those are the bad guys though the bad guys did that they're here they're, they were just there you know it was like my first moment of saying that and it's also very distracting and hard to see and all that other stuff and and I remember when I was running training and we would do mount scenarios my one of my big things you know I'd say all right guys how many tires are you gonna put out to burn and and I remember one time someone's like you know we're not gonna do the tires tonight and I said no we're doing the tires tonight always set tires on fire let that be known because it screws things up and I think it was just my own personal desire to be taken back to that place like you were just talking about well I remember those mouth scenarios and going out there with you you know you're running that training when I was at you know when I was an op- operations officer and executive officer at, at a SEAL team and it took me right back there oh yeah it took me the smell that you know the, the stench we'd hear the the call the prayer you know, comes out and you'd see the graffitied walls and yeah. the, it was, it was so much like that yeah. and it was awesome. You know, yeah, when you awesome put your was, night vision on out in our, when we really got after it with the Mount training facility and really did everything we could to simulate what the guys were going to experience, man, you couldn't, you couldn't tell actually. You could, you, if you, if you got transplanted, you wouldn't be able, cause we did the, 
even the because in Ramadi all the the electrical wires were all knocked down so we'd string these crazy wires up just randomly in our in the streets to make it look because because guess what you'd be running and you get caught up in this wire and you got to make sure it's not an IED so you can't just pull you know it's all these little things to simulate as best you can but thank God you didn't have the rivers of raw sewage running yeah, through the, the streets. Yeah. Sometimes, every, every once in a while, our guys would slip and fall down into, which was just horrible. I had one of my first deployment. This guy was walking, and I don't know what this was, but we were just walking, and all of a sudden he walked and he fell through. It was like there was a hardened shell, <laughs> and he fell through this hardened shell right into a sewage pit, and because all the, I don't know what the shell was made of, but it was. We know what was under it. It was nasty. There was a big metal pipe across, uh, across. <laughs> what, you remember we called it Shit Creek. That was actually the official name on the map because yeah, it map. was a, literally like a creek of raw sewage. And there was a big metal pipe, and we often patrolled across this pipe. Um, you, you know, it was is the one where you didn't have to jump it; you could actually just walk across. Um, and later, actually, uh, some of the army uh, guys had burned the grass out there, and there was there were IEDs all around it. We didn't even know we were there when we first patrolled in. Uh, but one, one guy was with us. He slipped off the pipe and uh, <laughs> fell into the fell into uh, Shit Creek, um, which and now you know he's he's got to be in that uniform for the next uh, twenty four hours. It's only, it's only yeah. a forty eight hour operation. No, Don't worry uh, about it. No shower. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no shower for a good twenty four forty eight hours. That's good times right there. Uh, I think the the one thing missing too from um, you know from uh, that we couldn't recreate in that in that mountain area that, that you were running. It was it was so awesome, but the just the heat. Like the yep. the heat was overwhelming, and I think that's that's what really got guys, even guys that were in really good shape, who who were you know great athletes. Um, if you weren't acclimatized to that, did, did, it just didn't matter um, until you really got acclimatized. Um, it would crush you, and I remember that going in. You know, even like I said, at nighttime, it's still like ninety five degrees outside, and and you know when the sun's coming up, there'd be a little bit of breeze, kind of in the early morning. You get a little bit of coolness and we're talking it's like high 90s right but you know it's going to hit 117 you know yeah. for the high that day and you're sitting on the rooftop and and my my rucksack is still uh covered with tar where you know the the, the tar starts creeping out of the rooftop and just melting into your bag and sticking onto your weapon and your gear and your uniforms now i sweat a lot like i i'm, I'm a sweat i sweat a lot as a person i remember but I remember one time, and it wasn't when we did Cop Falcon the first time, but it wasn't when they had air conditioning in there yet. It was like in one of those inter-between ops, and I was down there. You guys went out. You guys were working, and I was in there at Cop Falcon, and, and I had come down in a Bradley or in a Humvee. Bradleys are hot. Humvees are both hot, but but then I got in the building, and I was coordinating with you know the, the company commander, and, and I'm sitting there, and now I'm not doing Now, I haven't been doing anything physical. In fact, I, I think I was inside with, with my gear off just with my body armor on, but I'm just sitting there, and and I'm sitting there like looking at a battle map, and it's just me. No one's with me. I'm just looking at the battle map. I think I'm trying try talking to you. You're probably heading out in the city, and you're going somewhere, and I'm looking at where you are, and there is a stream of sweat. I'm not doing anything. I'm just literally sitting looking at a map, and there is a tick of sweat coming off of my nose onto the, onto the battle map, and I thought to myself... Bro, it's hot. <laughs> it is hot here. Well, and you were in the shade then. And no, this was this was at night. This oh, you were at, at night time. Like we came down at night. You guys inserted, and I was just sitting there. So I'd been sitting there for, and that's one thing that I I always know this is the the hottest time of day in the desert is when the sun goes down. I, I don't know if this is a true physics thing. If you're a scientist and you want to come back at me with the facts, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> but let me tell you what it feels like. And I I say this. The heat comes out of the ground. So all that sun's been beating down on the ground all day. The heat comes out of the ground, and then the wind stops. And so it's just that is the hottest time. It's true here in the Southern California desert, and it was true in Iraq that the hottest few hours was after the sun goes down. Like the next two to it's three hours is brutal. the worst. Absolutely brutal. On on that that same operation, I remember we were we were running out of water. Because we you know we we were out we had moved out three hundred you know three hundred yards or so down the street and set up in that big four story apartment building and uh, we were running out of water so we had to do we, so I remember we were doing a daytime I was like we, we grabbed a couple guys we had a stretcher you know, we have a foldable like Israeli stretcher that we we open up and me and, and three other guys are 
sprinting down the street because we know there's snipers out here. I mean, we're yeah. right in the, in, you know, we're outside the perimeter and we're running back to where you were at the Cop Falcon and we loaded up a bunch of cases of water and some MREs and then we're sprinting back. And I remember getting back from that, you know, and that we did that at like, it's probably like two o'clock in the afternoon yeah, and it's literally here. like 117, 120 degrees. And I, I was, of course, we had all our gear on, so, and we do, we're doing this 300-yard sprint carrying a stretcher that probably weighs like 150 pounds. We were bringing enough water for like 20 guys, and it, you know, and food, and uh, it was. I, I I don't think I. I mean, I look like I just got out of the shower for sure. Just sweating Completely through all drenched. your gear, and and a lot of our eye pro. You know, there was the requirement you had to wear eye pro. Uh, eye protection, so either like like ballistic glasses or uh, and what guys had been wearing previously was the goggles that you wear um, to protect your eyes. You couldn't wear it because if you had it on, it would be completely fogged up and you couldn't see ten feet in front of you. And it was like, okay, I can protect my eyes or I can like get shot and killed or trip over something and not be able to get where I need to go. Yeah. And you, yeah, because you'd be completely blinded by the uh, by the the fog. <laughs> And nothing where we try to get the high speed ones with like the little oh the yeah little, the, like, fans. the fan they inside little, you know talk, what's about high tech here's some high tech echo <laughs> we got these goggles that had little miniature fans in them to blow fresh air in there yeah, they, yeah. they Didn't suck work at all yeah. everything yeah. sucks nothing works <laughs> like windshield wipers you know those ones <laughs> that's what you need <laughs> something uh, that was another little TV T bruiser saying. Everything sucks. Nothing works. You know, because someone would say like, "Hey, man, hey, hey, you know this this thing's not working." I'd be like, "Yeah, everything sucks. Nothing works. Deal with it." You know, exactly. it's like, "Oh, yeah. everything sucks. Nothing works." Next, we know that it's a given. Everything sucks. Nothing works. BTF. Yeah, BTF. 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 And the th- actually, we talked about the heat, but you know, what we didn't talk about is the damn moon dust. Because you know, he's talking about their they had orange red dust. The moon dust in Ramadi was nasty and gnarly, and it was everywhere. I remember specifically, Corregidor was completely covered, which was the, the, the camp on the eastern side of Ramadi where the first of the 506 was there, and then we had a, a detachment of seals there. And when you'd go over there, it was just it was every step you took, there was a even trails that were getting walked on all day to the head or or to the chow hall, those trails that were walked on every single day, every it didn't matter. Poof, poof. Every time you took a step, there's a little cloud burst of this moon dust, this fine, fine moon dust that covered everything. And it was all over the city, too. It was like talcum powder. And, and it, it, it was, you know, those tanks would come in, they'd crunch up the concrete. So even if it was, even if it had been previously paved, now you're going to, you got, you got sand, you know, dirt and, and, uh, and, it just, I remember it getting in everything. And so we par- park our vehicles. I remember it, particularly at uh, Combat Up was Grant, you know, right in the heart of just South Central Ramadi. Um, and it was patrolling out of there. You were in like knee deep moon dust. <laughs> so, you know, now, and, and we're patrolling out into a sniper overwatch position, moving out at nighttime. And not only is it dusty and getting all over stuff, it gets in your weapons and, and you know, you have to constantly clean them. And, and, and uh, but I, rem- I remember we'd get to where we were going, you know, get in an overwatch position. And you'd often have to take your boots off and just dump out like a pound of sand of that moon dust that had gotten inside your boots. Uh, that it got in through the little holes yeah, in your little your tiny boots. tiny holes yeah. on your jungle. Wait, boots. what is moon dust? Though? Just it's the, the dust that happens. Fi- yeah, it's it's this fine, fine, fine. It's like Leif said. It's like talcum powder, but yeah. it's dirt. It's some kind of fine, fine sand. Again, I'm sure there's some scientist that's going to say that what it specifically is, uh-uh. but. As far as I'm concerned, it's moon dust. That's yeah, where yeah, it came yeah. from. But this isn't. We're not but, talking about like uh, at, on the beach, you know, in Hawaii. Right, right, we're yeah. talking. This, this is like you, if you you walk through this stuff, it's all over you. It yeah. gets everywhere. It, it, there's literally walking through it, and there's like a cloud of dust coming yeah. behind you. It's, it's just so it, fine. It's, oh yeah, and when it's a vehicle would drive by, yeah, when a vehicle would drive by, same thing. It'd be just a guy. You'd be walking, and you you're just breathing this moon dust in. Mm-hmm. It's and it, it's nasty. You, you blow your nose, and it's just, yeah. just oh, it's like, brown. It's yeah. the color of the moon dust. Wet. Yeah, like when you um, if you ride dirt bikes or something in a more of a dry area. I mean, obviously, I'm sure it's way worse in you know in Ramadi, but same thing. When you breathe, you breathe yeah, it you, in. Yeah, just you dirt. Cough, you're breathing it in. Out. You cough. It's gonna it's come everywhere. out. Yep. Yeah. Blow your nose. It's just that. <laughs> That's so just nasty. how it is over there. Just it moon was awesome. dust everywhere. Good times. I'm taking us back to the book. They moved like mules. By daylight, they took sniper fire. At night, they were mortared. But it was not battle. It was just the endless march, village to village, without purpose. Nothing won or lost. They marched for the sake of the march, 
They plodded along slowly, dumbly, leaning forward against the heat, unthinking, all blood and bone, simple grunts, soldiering with their legs, toiling up the hills and down into the paddies and across the rivers and up and down again, just humping. One step, and then the next, and then another, but no volition, no will, because it was automatic. It was anatomy, and the war was entirely a matter of posture and carriage. The hump was everything, a kind of inertia, a kind of emptiness, a dullness of desire and intellect and conscience and hope and human sensibility. Their principles were in their feet. Their calculations were biological. They had no sense of strategy or mission. They searched the villages without knowing what to look for, not caring, kicking over jars of rice, frisking children and old men, blowing tunnels, sometimes setting fires and sometimes not, then forming up and moving on to the next village, then other villages where it would always be the same. They carried their own lives. The pressures were enormous. In the heat of early afternoon, they would remove their helmets and flak jackets, walking bare, which was dangerous, but which helped ease the strain. Now, that, that section obviously paints something different than what we experienced, because, and, and, and you can see what he's talking about, you know, you've got soldiers that don't know what the mission is, that don't understand what the strategy is, and, and you know, there's all kinds of books about Vietnam, and and at the highest, you know, we talk about sometimes how maybe we didn't do a good job of telling people what the strategy was, and but at the highest levels in the Vietnam War, there's confusion on what the strategy is, so there's no way that some frontline grunt understands why he's Clear in this village and not that village or why it's the, that village and not this village. They, they just don't know. So what does it become? It becomes like they are just robots, human robots moving forward. And I think we were very fortunate to be in a situation where, you know, we had a better understanding. And, and, and again, we talk about this in the book. We could have done a better job and should have done a better job of making sure that everybody understood more. But there was understanding there was at a minimum everybody understood at a minimum the evil that was there the evil that was there in Ramadi in Iraq that was torturing people raping people killing people trying to enslave people everybody understood that there was evil there and that's what we were fighting against trying to help this local populace who was completely at the mercy of this insurgent group which by the way had no mercy so I think we had that benefit for us but one thing that is completely unchanged is this talk of this strain the strain that is put on the soldiers on the ground and when you think back to the strain that you felt that your men felt what do you think of what, what do you think of when you think of the strain? I, I can absolutely relate to that. I mean, it's it's the it's something you and I talked about, right? When we got home, when we got home, it was you called it the burden, right? When we got we got home, and we I didn't even recognize how powerful that was. You know, and I remember talking to you about it. We were like, we all of a sudden we could relax. Like there weren't weren't people trying to kill us, right? There there were, when we arrived back from that deployment to Ramadi, and we're back in San Diego, and and you and just the recognition that, it's not just from our personal, like, hey, not, people aren't trying to kill me, but like, I no longer am carrying the burden of the decisions that I make and people's lives are on the line, right? That, like, at this moment, right now, and I wanna make sure that I've thought through all the contingencies. You know, it, are we ready? You know, for for the, these worst case scenarios, have we have we planned? You know, have we rehearsed these things? Have we trained? Have we thought through what the enemy might do? How could they hit us where we hadn't even foreseen it? You know that that burden that you just carried all the time. And and for me, you know, man, after after Mark got killed and Ryan got wounded, it was just um, 
you know, four months into our deployment, it was just this recognition, like, man, we're, that can happen at any time. And, and I knew it could happen at any time prior to that. You know, it wasn't that we got complacent or that, but it, but it was, we've gotten away with it so many times that you all, you, you start kind of, kind of see like, maybe we can make it through this thing, you know, without losing people as, as, uh, and just going out there and, and, you know, as you've talked about, you can just only get lucky so many times, like with all that evil and all that horribleness out there that, uh, that it can happen at any time. And, and that's the strain that I think that I certainly, I felt and for other guys felt when you see that your, your brother's killed or wounded, uh, when you've had close calls and you recognize like just how, um, how close we are to death at any time, any time we're rolling out there, that uh, um, that is a strain. It is a strain on you, and it's something that wears on you. Um, and I, I think um, for me, it was just always always worried about like just the the. And, and when you see the violence of it, you know the the vehicle graveyard that we rolled out through. Every time we're driving out the gate, and just the the twisted hulks of metal that used to be a vehicle that carried men or women in them. Uh, you know, and those were U.S. troops that were either killed or horribly wounded that were in that vehicle that were destroyed. Or if you you see an ID go off and there's a hundred foot fireball in the air and just frag, you know, the the metal fragments raining down, you know, for hundreds of yards in all directions from something like that. You're like just the power of that, you know, the the violence of machine gun fire that's coming in close to you. And I, I often describe as just the. You know, I wrote about in the book the the biggest, strongest guy you can imagine just smashing the wall with a hammer next to you as hard as he can. An inch from your head. An inch from your head, just throwing concrete fragments everywhere. And there's, um, and and you know, now it's seven to eight hundred rounds per minute of that of that coming in at you with a belt fed belt fed machine gun. Maybe there's multiple ones shooting at you. RPG rockets, just this rocking explosion, this rings your bell. You know, even if it's just, just on the wall outside, you know, if one of those things hits the window and and and, and detonates on the bars on the window, it's going to just frag everybody in the room. It's going to be horribly wounded or killed. So that that was a strain all the time. And you know, I think the difference for us though is is the you know and and, and it, you know there isn't there were some certainly some guys uh, and you talked about leadership that we learned right. Get the guys carrying those heavy machine guns, the, the the belt fed machine guns and all the gear that with them, and they're like, man, do I have to carry this thing? You know, as a leader, we had to remind them why that was important. You know, they got that love hate relationship. The machine gunners they love to shoot that machine gun and they're awesome at it. They hate to carry the machine gun, right? It's a it's that love hate relationship. And um, so when they're going in on a foot patrol, that's a you know a mile foot you know mile and a half foot patrol into a, to a tough area and they're carrying all that heavy weight. They get focused on that, so you got you got to help them recognize like this is this is why you're such a critical part of the team and why we got to have these machine guns. Um, so you got to do you know as a leader something we had to do all the time. But I, I think for these guys in Vietnam, they're you know they're they're driving or flying into an area, patrolling into an area that's they, it seems like they're seeing they're seeing new terrain right. all the time. You know, for us in Ramadi, it was this tiny city that was it's like what three by three miles yep. you know across. You're talking about just the the, set, the central central Ramadi piece of it very small and we're going into the same areas all the time you know j street the j block you know papa 10 um you know these areas that uh going down baseline road and you know to 20th street and these areas that we we got to know and we understood you know where the 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 uh, the bad guys were operating out of and we'd been in so many of these buildings and we so then we had to have the we had to mix it up and not patrol down the same streets every time and try to come in and do some misdirection stuff uh, but we got to know these areas, um, and you know, even though it was a small area, you know, and these tanks might be less than a mile away from you. Maybe they're even a half mile down the road. You know, in, in that environment, if there's if there's you know thirty five IEDs that could destroy any one of which could destroy the the tank between you and them, half a mile away, they might as well be a hundred miles away. Doesn't matter. So you know, we had to plan for those contingencies. We had to be ready, but that was a strain that I certainly remember well, and, and I, I remember that conversation, as I'm sure you do, coming back and, and, and recognizing like, wow, I didn't even realize how heavy that strain was until we got back, and it was it was it was lifted. Yeah, and it, it, it didn't happen right away. It happened like we were con at least I feel like we were conditioned. It, it would be it would be like going to a planet where there was much much higher gravity. And 
you you don't even realize how much more weight you're carrying and then when, when we came home it wasn't like it instantly the gravity changed it was like it's slowly in one day it, for me it was about a month that I, I, I all of a sudden I woke up and instead of the first thought I had when I woke up of like what's gonna happen today what bad thing can happen today it was like oh, I think the waves look good and I'm going surfing and to go from that thought process from like you said it's the horror of the of the imminent danger because like like you said you, you can only get lucky so many times and you go out day after day after day and you got I'm um, watching guys all over my guys all over Ramadi there's no possible way that they can make it through today without taking a casualty and then they and then they make it through that day I got five elements three elements five elements two elements all out on the battlefield at the same time There's no way they're gonna make it through today without a casualty. They make it through today And guess what you wake up the next day and now you're carrying that day and today So you make it through that day now you're carrying three days and that just built and built and built and every once in a while obviously We would take a casualty and maybe you get a little reset, but you don't it's just there and it's there heavy all the time. And what's really interesting about this is you might be thinking as Leif explained, as you explain, you know, those feelings and as I'm talking about right now, you might think that we were sullen and worried and sweat and and panicking or but but I'm sitting here thinking about it. We would and everybody in the in the task unit we were having fun. We were laughing. We would have conversations. We'd make fun of each other. We'd make fun of our friends. We'd make fun of our boss. We'd make fun of everybody. We'd laugh. We'd have a great time. And the 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 strain, even though there's there's you know fun and good times on top of it, that strain is absolutely there, and it stays there the whole time, and it just builds. I think the big illustration for that to me was when an operation was going on. Right, and vehicles are lined up. Like, get, you know, the vehicles are lined up out, out on the. We had this that main street, you know, outside of uh, of the the uh, the TAC, Tactical Operations Center, and you know where your office was. And, and uh, I remember that that bond that we had in, in Task Unit Bruiser. You know, so often you get well, the SEALs are doing their thing, and you got the support personnel that are running the radios and the CBs that run the camp, and they they just do different stuff, and they don't, you know. It, what was so awesome about tasking a bruiser was that we line those trucks up and we know we're going out, you know, we're going out at operation. And, and if you, you were, weren't, if you weren't coming on the op, I know you would, you would always be out there, you know, out there shaking everybody's hands and talking to them and, it, and not in a way of like, you know, not in a way that there was morbid, right. But in a way of like just the respect and, and knowledge that anytime we're going out, like at any one time, there may be, there may be uh any of these guys that are rolling out may not be coming back from this. They may be coming back in a body bag, and uh, and that we had to be ready for that at all the time because it was almost a daily, daily thing. And I just not only you know for for you and the the support person of the comms guys, you know our our, our radio men that were out there. These aren't seals, and they're, but they're out there getting the radios ready and helping us out. And people just come, you know. Uh, you know, uh, our our, our uh, operations specialist, you know, chief coming out there. I, I remember all those guys just lined up, shaking hands, talking to people. It was just that. And, and for the few ops that, you know, that I didn't go on with another, another uh, uh, if we had something else going on and another unit's going out with our guys uh, on a different operation, I'm not a part of the same thing, like going out there, talking to those guys, shaking their hands and knowing that, like, they may not be coming back from that. Um, and I think that was the biggest that was the biggest to me, like illustration of like that strain. And again, we laughed, we joked. It wasn't there was nothing morbid. We we were telling jokes and laughing and kidding each other, um, but uh, but that was really there. And I remember we got relieved, you know, by the next SEAL team, SEAL Team Five, that came in, um, and you know, good good bros of mine that I'd served with because I'd come from SEAL Team Five, um, and uh, I knew those guys when they were going out too. You know, I knew what they were going out into. You know, and I just remember. Uh, going out there for that goodbye to them and, and shaking their hands and, and talking to them about because we knew exactly what they were going into and they're going to keep keep getting after it. Yeah, it was one of the. I remember when those guys came and I, and I was doing like the turnover brief to their whole troop, and I, I was I, you know I had to sign I uh, put a, a slide up and I was going through this and that and the other thing and I'm like okay, you guys are going to take casualties, and and. It, like I never thought in a million years 
that somebody would be briefing me hey you guys are going to take casualties I'm like oh you guys might hey it's dangerous I was like you guys are going to take casualties that is what is going to happen and that might sound negative but that was the facts that, that it was a hundred percent true that they were going to take casualties and we knew it we knew it and that's what was so hard to shake their hand and tell them goodbye and good luck and and watch them roll out for the first time alone without us and know that could be tonight and could be tonight I'm new uh hit one hit another section right now This is talking about talking about the men again. I'm going to the book. For the most part, they carried themselves with poise, a kind of dignity. Now and then, however, there were times of panic. When they squealed or wanted to squeal but couldn't, when they twitched and made moaning sounds and covered their heads and said, Dear Jesus, and flopped around on the earth and fired their weapons blindly and cringed and sobbed and begged for the noise to stop and went wild and made stupid promises to themselves and to God and to their mothers and fathers, hoping not to die. And back to what we were just talking about. To have guys, and you know, we we did a podcast about a guy named Colonel DePeak and his his book called Battle Studies. And when he describes men, one of his key points is he's saying that men are horrified and they're scared of death and that they have this just incredible, uh, obviously this under underlying will of self-preservation, right? That's the that's the thing that fuels people. And he just talks about this tiny percentage of of men that will overcome that, and they'll be brave. And to think that we were lucky enough to serve with guys in our task unit. And to see the next task unit come in and to see the soldiers and see the Marines to overcome that strain on a daily basis. That is absolutely one of the most humbling things that I think I will ever experience in my life. That's what that's what courage is all about. You know, I think uh, just to to see guys, you know, that are just in the thick of the fight with bullets missing their heads by inches you know i remember uh i remember on the rooftop of building 99 right on 20th street in the war we were getting hammered i mean enemy rounds coming in by hundreds and hundreds of rounds coming in shattering the windows and i remember our, our eod bomb disposal technician awesome awesome guy and he's he's laying on the rooftop and there's armor piercing rounds coming through the roof punching through concrete wall you know that's just like three inches over his head and he's just laying there and and i remember crawling up there trying to figure out hey is everybody okay and he's like looking at me like thumbs up laughing about it and i mean just the humor of those guys right dealing with that um and no one you know again that that could happen at any time but you know um just seeing the guys, guys like Mark Lee, right? just the most hilarious guy you could imagine, just cracking jokes, you know, and singing the, you know, the cheese ball 80s tunes, you know, I am the warrior and and, uh, and us laughing about and talking about that stuff and just, just that's how they dealt with it, you know, and, and, and but it just tremendous courage and, you know, not just our SEALs, not just guys that, that we work with, those, those Marines and the soldiers that we served alongside and just, um, watching those guys day in and day out, you know, um, who often didn't have as much control over what they were doing as we did, you know, at, down on the, the front line level, um, but just out there getting after it with a great attitude, uh, and you know, no, nobody's fearless, right? Nobody, you know, some people think, oh, the, uh, we, you know, we get that question all the time, right, from businesses like, well, it's you, you know, it's 
uh, mortals are you know fearful, but you guys are fearless. Like no, nobody's fearless. Like you you recognize how mortal you are, and that can happen anytime. And yet you see these guys just just totally selfless. You know, courage with just incredible courage to overcome that, and just amazing. I mean, that's that's really to me. Um, that is the that is the bright light you know that we brought back from you know from that conflict to, to see and witness that and just the the tremendous human spirit that can overcome anything indeed we're yeah, gonna kind of wrap up this section right now with one last little piece of the book here and this is one of the guys named lavender last name lavender he gets killed and the lieutenant takes the blame himself he, he he feels that that blame and part of it he kind of blames on his his thinking about his girl back home Martha and he's thinking he wasn't doing everything he could do and what could he have done better and where did he let his guys down and what he could do different from now on and I'm going to the book he loved her but he hated her no more fantasies he told himself henceforth when he thought about Martha it would be only to think that she belonged elsewhere he would shut down the daydreams this was not Mount Sebastian it was another world where there were no pretty poems or midterm exams, a place where men died because of carelessness and gross stupidity. Kiowa was right. Boom. Down. And you were dead. Never partly dead. Briefly in the rain, Lieutenant Cross saw Martha's gray eyes gazing back at him. He understood. It was very sad, he thought. The things men carried inside. The things men did or felt they had to do. He almost nodded at her, but he didn't. Instead, he went back to his maps. He was now determined to perform his duties firmly and without negligence. It wouldn't help Lavender, he knew that. But from this point on, he would comport himself as an officer. He would dispose of his good luck pebble, swallow it, maybe, or use Lee Strunk slingshot, or just drop it along the trail. On the march, he would impose strict field discipline. He would be careful to send out flank security, to prevent straggling or bunching up, to keep his troops moving at the proper pace and at the proper interval. He would insist on clean weapons. He would confiscate the remainder of Lavender's dope. Later in the day, perhaps, he would call the men together and speak to them plainly. He would accept the blame for what had happened to Ted Lavender. He would be a man about it. He would look them in the eyes, keeping his chin level, and he would issue new SOPs in a calm, impersonal tone of voice, a lieutenant's voice, leaving no room for argument or discussion. Commencing immediately, he'd tell them they would no longer abandon equipment along the route of march. They would police up their acts. They would get their shit together and keep it together and maintain it neatly and in good working order. He would not tolerate laxity. He would show strength, distancing himself. So he falls back on what we fall back on all the time on discipline on standard operating procedures on maintaining everything in good working order and one of the things that you can see here and people we get this too is you'd think these guys from Vietnam of course they're gonna be paying attention of course they're gonna keep their weapon your weapon keeps you alive in a firefight of course you're gonna keep your weapons clean but he as the leader he has to lead 
And I think that's a common misconception. And, and we do talk about it all the time. And it's one of the most frequent questions I get asked. Like, well, you know, in the SEAL teams, you've got everyone's motivated and everyone's focused and it's a life or death. You know, so they're going to stay sharp and they're going to follow procedure no matter what. And, you know, my, my team's not like that in the business world or, you know, people I work with aren't like that. And the best teams, they only follow that procedure, right? Because they've got leaders that are stepping up and making it happen. And, and look, we have some amazing people in the SEAL teams, just like we have some amazing people in the military, um, in Army and Marine units and other, and other special operations units, et cetera. But... Even with life or death on the line, people get complacent. People start letting the ball drop, not cleaning their weapons when they need to or, or not following a procedure or letting their guard down because, well, we've done this operation a dozen times and nothing bad's happened, so nothing bad's going to happen, right? That's, it's like this common human uh, emotion that you just make these assumptions. And so the only way that units are going to stay focused and not have that happen when they've got good leaders. They got a fire team leader in charge of his four guys is stepping up and making sure that his guys are squared away and staying focused. They've got a, you know, they've got a squad leader making sure that his squad is squared. The, the LPO leading petty officers out there making sure that guys are dialed. They're not cutting corners. I mean, I, I always saw that with guys. You know, we've been in these sniper overwatch positions. You got like some of them had like one stairwell in and out. And someone's got to watch that stairwell. Someone's got to have a weapon and looking down that stairwell. For 72 hours. Yeah, and so, you know, hopefully we can rotate some guys out so it's not right. just the same right. guy. But but even so, if you it's going to be several hours of you watching down that stairwell. And it's boring as, as hell, right? And guess what? You're the only guy watching that stairwell. And everyone else has got their backs to you. So if you're not doing your job, you're going to those people are getting shot in the back. And yet if... What happens? Hey, we, hey, I've been here. I've been on the stairwell. Hey, look, man, doesn't we've done this operation a dozen times, or we've been in this building multiple times. Nobody's ever come up the stairs. I've been sitting here for hours on end. Like, hasn't happened. So, you people will fall asleep. People will stop paying attention. And only if you've got good leaders who are going to go check on that guy and make sure that he recognizes that. Listen, everybody's dependent on you. You know, not only are you going to get killed if someone slips up the stairs, but the guys, people are going to get shot in the back, and you, they were dependent on you to have their back. And it requires those good leaders at every level stepping up and going and checking on that guy. And if he is tired, he can't stay awake, rotate him out, put somebody else in there. But it requires leadership at every level. Um, so even with life and death on the line, people get complacent. And this really goes to what you, know, you and I talk about all the time, which is what does it really mean to take care of your people? You know, that ear, well, I want to be liked, you know, so I don't want to be a real hard ass and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like, um, you know, I, I don't want to push too hard in that direction or like if they cut this corner, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and, and obviously you can go too far in that direction, right? But you become the slave driver. But, but <clears throat> are you really taking care of your people if you're allowing them to cut some corners that they shouldn't be, you know, or to get complacent when they shouldn't be? And the answer is no, of course not. You're setting them up for failure. Um, and so you as a leader have got to step up and, uh, and make sure that your peer, you know, the peers around you, if you're not in a leadership position, um, it would certainly as a leader, make sure that your team and those around you are towing the line and following those standard operating procedures and, and, and achieving that highest standard possible because that's what is going to allow them to stay alive on the battlefield uh, and ultimately accomplish the mission and certainly dominate and win on their battlefield anywhere, you know, in business and life. Yeah, you can definitely see that uh, all the things that L Lieutenant Cross rattles off that he's going to now start imposing. He's going to start taking care. He thought he was taking care of his men before by by letting them have dirty weapons and not hounding them about that, by letting them drop gear on the trail, by not sending out flank security because it's a pain in the ass. He thought he was taking care of his guys, and he got one of his guys killed. And that is exactly the point. When you're taking care of your people, that means you're taking care of them. That means you're holding the line, you're holding the discipline, and you're making sure that they are as safe as you can possibly make them while still accomplishing the mission. And that is the, it's pretty much what we had for this book, by the way. Again, it's called Tim O'Brien. The name of the book is called The Things They Carried. Definitely a, a, a solid read, and, and I would check it out, and Echo will have it up on the, on the website. And, yeah, I know. For those of you that are going to come at me 
and say it was a fiction book. So now you're going to start submitting to me every fiction war book that's ever been written. And I know there's some damn good ones out there. And there's probably some I'm going to end up doing. But um, yeah, this is one of them that is. And again, it's 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 fiction, but clearly it's based on experiences. And it and and once again, you can see that even though war evolves and war changes, the the, the fundamental. The fundamentals of human nature in war don't really change. I'm I'm not into fiction books. I don't remember the last time I read a fiction book. I'm gonna read that book because uh, <laughs> that immediately resonated with me and puts me back in those just the sights and smells and the uh, and the stuff that we carried and, and opens up some you know it's just uh, I look I look forward to digging into it in some detail. It's a good one. And you know that, that's the thing when when you are dealing with these books. And you start to really, really listen to them and read them. There's just there's always so much more than than you get out of it the first time you go through it. So that's why for me, you know, reading it and then going through it again, and then sitting here and reading it. And and now when I put the headphones on and read it, it's it, they definitely they definitely hit you and you get more out of them, in my opinion. No doubt. There's something magical about putting the headphones on, you know, because you, you had read a couple of those excerpts and we were talking about this over the last, last couple of days and what the podcast is going to be about. And, and uh, it did not, it did not, you know, once sitting here listening to you read it with the headphones on, it's like takes me immediately back to Ramadi thinking about the stuff that we, you know, the things that we carried with us and the moon dust that we patrolled through and those smells and stenches and the heat. And um, frankly, uh, I'm, I'm pretty eager to go back and get some right now. I'm ready to make it happen. Indeed. And you know what we got to do is it's the same thing with, with these other books, with, with our book. And, and I know, you know, we were kind of talking about this a little bit. You know, when you write a book, you're confined in, in some way to the structure of the book and to the length of the book and to the balance of the book. And so you can't just drill down on some facet that might be it might not be totally pertinent to that particular way that it's laid out. But what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get next time you come on, we got to do we got to do our own book. We got to do extreme ownership at least get it through a few chapters because because we we know the authors, <laughs> you know, and we know that there's so much back behind those that it would be awesome to sit there and and kind of give a bunch of those you know a bunch of the backstory behind these things and and I think next time we gotta we gotta make that happen let's do it I like that idea there's uh, there's so much there and it is uh, even going back and reviewing the book you're thinking about these little things I'm like oh we should have said that and obviously it doesn't illustrate this you know the the point and we got to focus it but uh, yeah there's a lot a lot behind that I mean I think about that blue on blue scenario you know yeah. a, you know it just an opening chapter extreme yeah. ownership and what that was about and all that went into that um, and uh, yeah be great to talk about that in some detail We'll have to get that next time. Now, Extreme Ownership, name of the book. Extreme Ownership is also the name of something else that's about to happen. May 4th and 5th, the muster. The Extreme Ownership muster leadership conference. I guess, is that appropriate to call it a leadership conference? I'm not sure. I guess if you had to classify what it is, then maybe we put in that category. But to me, the muster stands by itself, you know. And I think the definitions that, you know, that we utilize a gathering together of troops uh, well, to I prepare guess, for war. <laughs> I guess that fits very probably. So I, I can't say I go into like big details about the muster, but I I just mention it in case people are interested in getting better, especially from a leadership perspective and really from a human potential you know getting to where you think you can get getting beyond where you can think you can get I don't talk too much detail about it if you, so since you're here and you're sitting here what do you think what's what what, what did you what were like the highlights of the muster because we just did the first one last year in October 2017 I thought it was gonna be cool 2016 or sorry 2016 I what did I say 2017 oh yeah that hasn't happened yet <laughs> no. I, I thought that the muster would be cool you know what I mean I thought hey this is gonna be cool like it's gonna be cool we're gonna you know t- meet a bunch of cool people and we're gonna talk about all this cool stuff and and do our best to pass on information and give and receive information and all that so I thought it was gonna be cool 
but it was a lot better than cool. It was it was freaking awesome. And what were like some highlights for you when you think about it? What are you excited about for New York? Well, you know, we talk to so many people all the time, right? And 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 awesome leaders, you know, from companies that we work with and uh, different organizations out there, and and it's just love love working with these leaders, love talking to them. I, I think, for, but the muster was there was just something magical about that. You know, I remember, uh, I we couldn't have even predicted that, right? Oh, I think I think you just came up with a new tagline: "Come to the muster." It's magical. Yeah, magical. <laughs> Come up with a new I'm word. Gonna, I'm going to take some shit for that. <laughs> Come to the. We're going to call it the magical muster. <laughs> Maybe we need to cut that. Maybe we need to cut that. So piece what out. was stays in? What was magical about it? Look, for me, what was it, here's 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 what uh, coming off the stage. What we're talking about, you know, we're leaving people the idea of why. You know they need to take advantage of every day the gift that's been given to them by those brave warriors that gave their lives so that they have the ability to pursue that. You know, and I, I remember coming off stage and you gave me, you just came up and gave me a big hug. You're not a hugger. <laughs> I don't hug and, people uh, very often. I was not, actually not working at all. on a takedown. Not at all. We'll call it. <laughs> I, I thought maybe something like that was coming. I was get I was getting ready. I was getting getting ready to to to, to, to sprawl. But uh, I, I remember that just just that emotion of like. This was an amazing event. It was an amazing event. I think what made it amazing was the, you know, we were able to interact with so many people, you know, and so many people that were in the game and had the same goals, the same drive. Exactly. And from so many different walks of life, you know, we had some awesome, we had some really high power, you know, senior executives from, from some great companies uh, to, you know, mid-level managers and, and frontline leaders that are just aspiring to take on greater ownership, entrepreneurs, you know, the, the uh, um, military, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, I mean, a- across the space, some people that we couldn't even envision or imagine from, you know, from, from a volunteer, you know, nonprofit organizations and things like that. Um, and interacting with so many different people that are eager to learn, to implement the, the principles of extreme ownership into their lives. That was awesome for me. And it, it was interesting to me, something I hadn't even thought about is the fact that, um, you know, after we spent folks, so many people had come up to me and said, you know, man, it was, it was worth the price of admission alone just to meet other participants here uh, and learn from them and, and, and learn from each other, you know, fellow troopers. And, uh, and it, was, it was just, it was awesome to see that. So for me, you know, all the events, we speak at events all the time and we, and we, we speak at great events uh, and we work with great leaders, but it, it was the absolute best event of all time that I've ever been a part of <laughs> best audience you know and I'm, I'm so fired up to go back uh, and it's gonna be it's gonna be that much better in New York right it's gonna be there'll be a few of the same folks that are gonna come and, and attend that were there in San Diego and there'll be a whole new group of people yeah. you know who, who couldn't come it, it, it'll be even bigger um, it, and it's gonna be awesome one of the things that that was awesome for me and I know it was awesome for you too because we talked about it but the interaction that we had with everybody right and and I remember when we were kind of setting and planning the event that was one of the things where you know we, we were talking about this we're gonna hey we do this we can have this person we do that. And, and and finally i just was like hey bro you know what we need to do we need to just be there no backstage no curtain nothing we need to meet and interact and answer questions and get in the game with everybody and that's exactly what we did like for instance you know there's there's, we'd do a section, we'd be, up, we'd be up talking for an hour, answering questions for an hour and a half. When we'd get done with that hour and a half, we would just step forward to the stage and step down onto the floor and there'd be people lined up to say, hey, what about this? Hey, you just said that. And what do you think I should do here? And it was like that for, for two straight days. And not just after the sessions, but morning workouts, yeah. right? And we, yeah. our, our, our 0445 Club PTs that were cranking out these awesome workouts. And and uh, and we, I mean, all levels of athletes. Right. There were some really high-end, you know, athletes or black, incredible black athletes. belt you know, jiu-jitsu <laughs> players to, to the, uh, you know, just, just some folks who've just started training or just started hitting the gym, been encouraged to by the podcast or whatnot, um, and came 
out and participate in that and and walking to, you know jogging over to or walking back from those the, those workouts talking to those leaders and people talking about hey what would you do in this situation you know and I remember uh, uh, having those conversations with people and you're helping them apply that stuff um, we've heard through social media so many of those people I, some of those specific conversations like I can't believe how good this worked and <laughs> here's what's going on I'm now I'm now able to I just got a promotion you know based on this you know the, those kind of that kind of feedback. We always talk about right. There's only two measures that matter: effective and ineffective. And, and how do you measure that? It's whether the team is is accomplishing the mission. You're effective. If you're not accomplishing the mission, doesn't matter how hard you're working. You're not effective. And for us, that measure of effectiveness is that people are actually going out and kicking ass in their world, and they're getting promoted. They're accomplishing their mission. They're building a better team. They're building better relationships with their boss. You know, with their peers, with the subcontractor they work for, with you know, and. Uh, they're, they're being more engaged members of their community, you know, a better parent, a better coach, a better team member uh, across all walks of life. And I think that's really our measure of effectiveness. Um, and uh, it was, it's just awesome to see so many folks uh, doing extraordinary things that were part of that, the, the muster. Um, and so looking forward to that May 4th and 5th in New York is going to be awesome. Uh, and it's going to be exactly what you described. We're going we're gonna to keep that no matter how how long we do this or how big the musters get, I, I never want to never want it to be uh, to lose that of of me and you staying engaged, you know, with participants, not hiding behind the curtain somewhere in the green room, but being out front talking to people, talking with leaders, uh, you know, and helping them apply this stuff to get better at what they do. This ain't the Wizard of Oz. We ain't gonna be hiding behind the curtain, and you know, for, uh, and you talk about. Measures of of success, effective, ineffective. Well, for me, like the biggest reward from doing the muster, it's it's similar to what we do with our with our business of helping businesses, and it's always great to get that feedback. But to get a mass scale of you know three or four hundred people and get that feedback about the promotions, the advancements, the the goals achieved, the fitness goals achieved, the relationship goals. To get that feedback has just been it's been awesome. So. Like you said, we look forward to seeing you there. And, you know, actually speaking of the muster, you're going to see Leif, yeah. You're going to see me, of course. You're going to see JP and Dave, Dave Burke, JP Donnell. They're going to be there. You're also going to see Echo Charles. He's going to be there fully. Fully. And kind of cruising, too. Yeah, but he's going to be there hard. fully cruising hard. Mm -hmm. So you can get to... Meet uh, most people want to meet Echo the most. He's like the bass player in the band that, like, no, you know, there's the lead guitarist, <laughs> and then there's the lead vocalist who's out front with the weird pants on. But everyone looks at the bassist in the back that's hammering down the tracks, laying it down. Cruising. Echo Charles cruising. You're gonna get to meet him. So, I, yeah, that was amazing to me. Actually, the number of people lined up to to take pictures with you and talk to to you. Yeah. I, was, I was I was getting jealous. I was like, <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. It's funny they don't ask me like real questions though. It's more like on a social level, which I I, I liked that. Well, you want to keep it that way? Yeah, easy questions. For if me, you got for like sure. a leadership question, you can yeah. go to Leif. You can go to me. Yeah. If you want to do some socializing. Yeah. Line, get in that Echo Charles yeah, line. Yeah. Go and shake his hand. <laughs> Echo Charles line. <laughs> you want to get in that Echo Charles line? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, one one thing about the muster in New York in particular is, uh, you know, like anything in New York City, you got a limited space. And uh, we, we sold a lot of tickets to that thing already. If you want to be there for, for it, May 4th and 5th, get your tickets now because I think we're going to sell this thing out. And uh, I think that's that's highly likely. So it may, those may not be there. I, I would I would get those things purchased ASAP um, if you if you want to be a part of that. Yeah, oh. do it. Big part that I noticed from the last muster is the P you mentioned this before where people they'll come in, they'll learn all this cool stuff and you know, like minded people, um, but they become like real good friends, you know? So like uh like that night when we had uh, ju the jiu jitsu training yeah. that night, you could tell I thought that oh these guys came they all came together. Yeah. No, no they didn't come together. No. They just became friends yeah. and now they're cruising as friends now. And know? there's people, you know, Doing things now. Yeah. We got podcasts. Yep. yep. Out. Yep. Brady and Simon. Brady doing and Simon. It. Also. Um, Debbie. 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 Debbie and yep. Sonia. And Sonia. Yeah. They got a mm. podcast going. There's, but yep. there's someone else. Anyways, so there's people that are, that's the what? Uh, Athena's podcast. You got the Trooper podcast. Trooper Project. Trooper Project. Yep. Modern Athena's. Modern Athena's. So there's things that are coming out. Those, those are 
people that just met. They weren't yeah. friends rolling yeah. into the buster. Yep. They formed relationships, yep. and now they're out just crushing things. Yeah, and that's how, yeah. you know how, like, I mean, jiu-jitsu does this a lot, where you come in and you're, like, you know, by yourself. And then after a while, hey, this guy likes jujitsu. This guy likes jujitsu. Oh wait, but wait, hey, you watched? I don't know. You know, same the same show. And slowly, like Hawaii Five O. <laughs> so, slowly, you start to gravitate towards these people. But this in this kind of situation, everyone's kind of like, um, like they're trying to get better. You know, mm. better at this, and it's so it's real similar. Better so, at life. At life in general. So. It's almost like a double gravitation effect, you know, Dude, where people like that's a scientific thing too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. that you know a lot of people it, don't yeah. know about the double gravitation <laughs> effect. <laughs> Bro, but but it with the muster, double gra- gravitation yeah. effect across is in board. full effect. Yeah, across, across the board. Across Bro, the board. and it's funny because you see it. You see like everyone's all talking. You know, like if I step back, I see you and Leif talking. You can kind of tell like all oh, you guys have known each other for a long time. That's kind of what you see. But then you realize, oh, they haven't known each other for a long time. It's just pure double That's gravitation. How, yeah, effect. that double gravi- gravitation effect. <laughs> I, I think some of that crossover too is, yeah. you know, when when you realize that, you know, a police officer who's sitting next to you has some of the same challenges that you have yep. as a, as a as a uh, a small business, you know, yep. entrepreneur yep. Uh, who you know, has the startup. same problems as this guy who's yep. the CEO of a big company. Yep. Who has the same problems as this person who's in a startup. Yep. So yeah, who have oh, by the way the same problems that Leif and I saw and experienced. On the battlefield, yeah, and there's solutions. This is the thing. Yep. Those problems, there are solutions to them. Yeah, they're they're out there. This isn't this isn't magic. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I know I don't want to bust you down here, <laughs> but there ain't no magic. Yeah. There's knowledge to begin. It's like jujitsu, yeah. right? Jujitsu isn't about magic. There's no magic to jujitsu. Sometimes I do say magic. It's jiu-jitsu magical, magic, magical. Yeah. You, but you do say it's a superpower. It's a it superpower. Is. And speaking sure. of jujitsu, we're going to be training some. That's they, right. New That's only, right. Friday evening, we're going to be getting on. Boom. So if you come to the muster, we're probably going to go no gi for travel purposes. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. So we'll go plan the no gi situation. Plus, Echo like, do you like no gi better? Oh, uh, it goes in phases. Oh, okay. So right I, now, I'm, it's I'm only kinda, only so you can wear your, uh, your your trooper, your trooper podcast rash guard. Rash guard right? Yeah, 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 for rash sure. Guard. Rash guard. Yeah, hash guard. Hash yeah. guard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that is gonna happen. Echo, like I said, back to my point. Echo Charles will be there, and come and see him. And in the meantime, Echo, if somebody does want to support this podcast, yeah. Can you let us know how to do it? Yeah, man. There's a few ways. Uh, but I recommend supporting yourself. We talked about being prepared, right? Leif Bevin. Um, So a good way to prepare is to train. And with training comes help, which is supplementation. I was one of these guys who did, who wasn't into supplements ever. Like, oh, that's like, uh, it's fake. It I don't work. need it. Don't need it. And really, it, it's kind of true. You kind of don't need it. So I thought. But if you get the right kind of supplement, like, okay, so, you you know, we talk about Creole oil. Okay, well, okay. Supplements do matter. So I'm going to talk about some. So I was, uh, I, were you there when I rolled the other day? On, when's the last time I saw you? Uh, a couple days ago. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I went in, I, I trained with Chris Ruiz, and he's, you know. I saw you guys rolling, yes, so yes. I was there that day. Okay, so we, we so rolled. fish, think, by the way. Yeah, and he goes hard. Black belt goes hard. Yeah, and I think I did three That's rounds with him. Soapfish. Yeah. Why do we call him soapfish? Because he's hard to get a hold. You of. can't he's hold this like a fish covered in soap. You yeah. can't hold on to him. Yeah, he's he like hard. slick and wiry and yeah. and greasy with a black belt and has the black. Belt yeah, it's one want. thing to be like a you know an untrained soapfish, which can be hard enough, by the way. Anyway, the point is, I I go with him. I did three rounds with him, you know, and a few more rounds with other people, and. You know that feeling when you do a workout and you're like, oh, I feel like, I feel like the workout's not done. I don't feel like as not like exhausted right. as I need to be after a workout like this. Yeah. <clears throat> so I kind of had that feeling, or I'm like, okay, I need to do it. Like, who can I go with? Like a hard, you know, I need Dang. to go like another round, right? And I remembered I took the Shun Tech. Yeah. You kind of forget about because I took. Like, I don't mean this in a bad way. I don't. Yeah. I don't mean this as this, a backhanded. This is gonna be bad comment sure but for everyone that doesn't quite know i don't normally see you as a guy that's going 
I need to get one more round. <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Well, th- uh, a no, lot of times you're like, no, uh, I'm no, actually no. good, you know, at that one. No, you're actually not right. Um, oh. You know, you're talking about the old me. Okay. Yeah. This the, is the pre this is, this is pre shroom tech. This is the <laughs> that, that the one you were talking about. The pre shroom tech, pre metcon. Oh yeah, we got you on the metcon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, that's not me. You know. I like. This you know me. what? You that that is, to your full credit. Yeah. You are different now, not just because of your skill level in jujitsu, but also because of your your metcon, your endurance, and all that. You've oh. definitely. You you used to be done. Well, yeah. So and I and I talked about this before. Where that's a good point though, because one kind of plays off the other, especially if you don't like being tired. So if you get tired early, you're like you're gonna do less and you're gonna try less things. You're gonna you know because you're kind of fighting that fight as well. Mm-hmm. You know. So when that tiredness goes away and you know how to deal with being tired, you're like okay, now I'm kind of free to. Mm-hmm try this if it fails i can try it again i cannot you know uh, if you're if you're not in good shape or if you if you buckle to being tired it's like you only have a few bullets in the clip mm-hmm. and once you're done you're kind of like oh my gun's worse <laughs> worthless now you know the gun looks good from lifting weights and you know all this stuff but it's done after a few bullets but you load up the bullets <laughs> endless bullets right <laughs> you can go shoot targets here to anyway well, that's how it, it is. is. I will get since I gave you a a, a negative yeah. on the old you. I'll say the new you. You got some. You got some good. Positive. You got that jujitsu. Yeah, which works. is way better than it used to be. Yeah, it, even even the old Echo Charles though. When uh, when we were rolling back in the day with uh, back in our the day. Our, uh, our our mutual friend Cake Nuts and I, he, he you always you always he'd, he'd go another round. Particularly for yeah. us, it was when he is our skill level was far below his. So oh, he, he liked those rounds. Was way easier. Let's Let's do way another easier. round of me yeah. smashing you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and keep in mind, in my defense, this is Jocko's evaluation of me. When he's like, "You're done." Well, yeah. When you're rolling with Jocko, you're kind of done. You know. <laughs> but I, it's not like I was just this sack of potatoes. That was just done. It no, wasn't if you like were rolling that. with the white belts, you were full of rounds. Uh, bro. That's what I'm hearing here from Leif The Babbitt. standard that comes out of Jocko is, is very high, I'll we'll say. Uh, you know? <laughs> understatement. Not, not understatement of the year <laughs> right there. I mean? Understatement yeah. of the not year. Not that he's wrong. Not that he's wrong. Listen, yeah. I mean, and he's, also, he's just full of compliments all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Leif just said no, that to you. me. I was like, hey, did I say something like this? You know, I think I, it was like something positive about Leif. And he's like, yeah, you did say that, and I remember it because it's like the one of the four compliments you give <laughs> you me in ever. the last twelve years. I was yeah. like, "Oh, that's cool." <laughs> yeah, man, don't but, happen often. Got to note them. Got to note them when they happen. No. But the, it that is true, and it does help, and not in just that way though. Not in just the way like, "Oh, I can, um, I'm in better shape, and that's good. That's true." But you just you can do jujitsu now without that added enemy in there, so you're like free to do more jujitsu and you get so better to, at jujitsu. So to sum up the last 12 minutes of conversation what you're saying is yes on it.com slash Jocko yeah you know I, <laughs> well, I got into the story it was a good one in my opinion um, yeah no that day that's how I felt I felt like yeah. ju- my workout I was physically actually, I, I was feel actually like I was actually thinking the same thing because the other thing about Chris Chris Soapfish is he moves a lot a lot he's yes. a mover yeah. and when you move even if the guy's lighter than you, you have to move with you them, gotta, or you know. you're or you're gonna get you're, you're gonna get caught. Oh, and so you true. had to move. You couldn't stop moving, and he's gonna move all the time on you. Yep. And th- that's why I was really impressed with the fact that I've trained you so well. <laughs> 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 I was impressed with how you yeah. kept bringing, you know, kept. Yeah. And you want to do another round? I could see it. So yeah. good on you. Good yeah. on you, Shroom Tech. And I did take and Metcon. The thing is, you forget you take Jiu-jitsu. it. <laughs> Because I took it like like an hour before I even, um, well, I guess it was about an hour before I actually was rolling. But it was like maybe half hour before I left. I, I, so I kind of forgot. I'll tell you, in this whole idea of Shroom Tech and what's the other one, Performance? Total uh, Strength The coconut performance. thing? Or it's like a, or the Strawberry Banana? Is that yeah, what the yeah, yeah. Total that, Strength. So if that's considered cheating, then I've been cheating a lot lately. Because yeah. I'm rolling in, man. A lot of times... I've already worked out in the day. I've yeah. been up all day. Yeah. I went, sir. I did a bunch of stuff. So it's not like I'm rolling in to the gym or to to to, to train the jujitsu, being all fresh. Right. I haven't been getting a massage all day. No, I've been actually <laughs> grinding it out all day. Yeah. And so sometimes I need to get on some of that. Yeah. Man. And so I'm this, gonna call it good. This is really why I say it's cheating because I'm always saying it while I'm looking at you, and it's cheating if it's like me against you. Who's you know who's the batter warrior kind mm. of thing 
And so, oh, but you're on Shroom Tech. Okay. Oh, okay. So you have a little help then. So, uh, you know, but no, if you're training and you want to learn jujitsu or you want to, um, you know, push performance so you because that's how you get gains you recover from exercise and you want to push exercise and you want to in jujitsu situation where you want to train be able to train longer without you know the burden of this fatigue where you might have to quit at a certain time or whatever don't have to quit no well you know you know what i mean you don't have to quit it is helpful this shroom tech <laughs> <laughs> at some point when you get rhabdo and you start pissing blood, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, right, yeah, it's probably, gotta, time, to, you gotta probably stop time to take some recovery. Yeah. All right, this is my nonverbal signal for let's move to the next item when I do this. Yeah, no, but there's still <laughs> a lot to be said, though. That's the thing. See, and I think that's really the value of this whole thing is that this needs you to be what? talked about. Let's if go. I knew this, like, back in the... You know, <laughs> that guy that you were talking about, that echo that you were talking about. Oh, if I knew this echo. kind of stuff, echo one point Yeah, I would. I would have spent very little time at echo one point Do you hold that against me? Because I could have told you about this stuff earlier. No, I don't, man. You know that's life. Maybe I was afraid to. Anyway. No, I wasn't. If Leif, I don't know if you're on shroom, the Shroom Tech or whatever krill oil, that's a big one. I haven't tried Shroom Tech, but I uh, I just got a new order of uh, krill oil in, actually from on it. So there you go. Just, just pull that. I got uh, I got some Strong Bone as well. Yeah, Strong Bone is good. Uh, yeah, those are good because they keep you in. Like you can, yeah. I do like super deep squats, and I had knee surgery, full on ACL, like all this stuff. Deep deep squats all the way, no problem, no factor. Krill oil, just boom, taking it through. <laughs> Nonetheless, if you guys like. These types of supplements go to onit.com. Slash Jocko. If you want 10% <laughs> off, you add a slash Jocko. Boom. Get yourself, keep yourself in the game. Also, good way to support Amazon. If you shop Amazon, click through our website, jockopodcast.com. There's a little Amazon banner there on the site. It's actually in the menu too now. Mm. You just, you know, on the top navigation menu is what you call it. Click on there before you do your shopping, whatever you're buying, whether it be these, these books and, or whatever. Um, you know, do it like that. You can support small, teeny, tiny action. Great support. Boom. Another way, of course, is to subscribe if you're on iTunes or any of these other podcasting platforms, whatever they may be. Stitcher, Google Play, all these ones. There's other ones too, but I'm just saying sub subscribe. That's the point, you know, um, even though you probably have already, so. Also, YouTube videos, more videos. I think I'm going to release one tomorrow. Oh, cool one. Little fun one. By tomorrow, you mean tomorrow from today? Yeah. So it already be, have been okay, released. Okay, so there's going to be a new one out. Maybe. I might not. Boom. Unpredictable. You know, we call that variable reward system that I'm delivering right now. <laughs> anyway, um, the YouTube channel, we have some videos on there. Uh, if you like the video version of the podcast or you like these other like chunks, of lessons or whatever that Jocko talks about. Um, subscribe. You'll get a little notification when they come up, when I upload them. If you want it. If you want, yeah. Of course. Because sometimes people don't, don't like to get notified. Yeah. I actually I like stop to get notified notifying. Because yeah. sometimes such a long period of time comes between when a video comes out from you. Yeah, it was like that before. I know, man. That was Those were hard times. <laughs> you know, it's not like that, that anymore. There's no way I could ever possibly know unless I got that little notification <laughs> that says, Jocko Podcast yeah. has just uploaded a video. And yeah, then man. I rejoice. Yeah, you kind of forget about it, really. Yeah, then I rejoice. The whole situation. <laughs> but yeah, no, I had to turn off the notifications for that one because it'll go off right when I finish uh, uploading. So I already know when they're uploaded. See what I'm saying? Mm. I do see what you're saying. Sensible. Too. Anyway. Makes sense. Cool. Um, the not the last way, but another way is um, if you wear t-shirts and you want to represent. Who doesn't wear t-shirts? Not me. I wear. T that's it. That's my whole uniform. <laughs> t-shirt. Boom. Um, but yeah, if you like t-shirts, you want to represent in this way. Boom. Jocko podcast shirts. Multiple types of shirts. Uh, rash guards as well for the no gi situation. Jiu jitsu, or. Like anything where you need range of motion, like running, cycling, CrossFit, all this stuff. Anyway, they're good. May or may not give you 19% improvement in all performance. Why do you say may not? I think that's like um, the scientifically literate way to put it. No, but there's it's it's actually will because it, yeah. there's no one that said, hey, I didn't get the 19% out of this gig. Yeah, <laughs> I think it, yeah. Actually, yeah, you're right. There you go. They, Boom, they Jocko say, I just said got eighteen point seven percent. Yeah, you know, you get one of these slackers that maybe you know. 
I don't know. If you have the rash guard, you're probably not a slacker, so I guess that's invalid as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, jockelstore.com. That's that's where you can get all the you know rash guards and, and cool shirts. I think they're cool. We made uh, we went through great lengths to get the good shirts, like good quality. One guy emailed me. Actually, not one guy. Just I got another recent email said it's my favorite shirt to wear because of how it fits and it because it's good. You know, it's not like a giveaway free shirt you get. You know, when you go to the, the soccer game or wherever you go. Anyway, they're cool. Check them out. If you like them, support that way. Get one and represent. And psychological warfare. Okay, so I'm gonna go into psychological warfare. If you don't know psychological warfare, if you're at a moment of weakness in your diet, workout. Uh, waking up in the morning you need a little boost little like someone there to sort of gently spot you help you through these moments of weakness you go on iTunes maybe Amazon Music wherever you can buy mp3s get psychological warfare Jocko Willink the little tracks you can listen you can put it as your alarm if you want or just listen to the whatever track you need and he'll get you through it I'm telling you here's the thing so Yes, day before yesterday, not yesterday. Yes, day before yesterday, I was about to work out. Felt like working out. Rested, boom. You know, took my pre-workout stuff, ready. I was like, all right, I'm, I'll listen to Psychological Warfare at my moment of strength. Has this ever been tried before? I don't know. That's the thing. That's what I was thinking at the time. <laughs> Bro, it's kind of like abuse. You know how like, you know how like you're, you drink coffee or something? You're like, fuck, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to drink some coffee. And when you're not tired and you drink it, it's like, I'm, I'm buzzing off there. And you have that good feeling. Now you're like double coffeeed up, ready to get after it. That's how you feel. It's like Dang. I'm abusing the psychological warfare. So it's warfare. not only for moments of weakness. M for moments of triumph is what it is. <laughs> that's it. Not even So even if you're feeling weak and you want a moment of triumph, that's what it is. So what, how was the workout is the question. The workout was dope. Of course it was dumb. Check me out, bro. <laughs> Pump still on. <laughs> anyway. Good. Um, you know, while you're clicking through Amazon, by the way, you can get on Amazon.com. You can get Jocko White Tea. Now, there's other reports have come in. And mm -hmm. this report well, I found interesting because this is a side effect, apparently. Of the tea? Of the tea. Mm -hmm. And that is, and this could be a positive side effect or it could be a negative side effect depending on who you are, but one guy reported that he drank some tea at night and he had 1.5 inches of beard growth overnight. <laughs> so if you want that, it could, could be positive, could be negative. Yeah. And also we had a, a police officer out there. And, and again, this is just, I'm just giving some new, some new testament testimonies that have come in. This one, um, one police officer, he's shooting the, El Presidente drill, which is a drill where you have two targets and you shoot two rounds at each target and you do a reload. And, and his time has decreased, which is an improvement, right? right. So he's be able to do this faster, yeah, 31%, which I think is really good, especially Big numbers. Yeah. This is a critical situation, right? You got two bad guys and then you got to do a reload. You might want to have some Jocko White team. That's, you. that's almost double the 19%. Yeah, it's good. Dang, yeah. And, and the thing is that I want to make sure everybody understands is that this isn't like conjecture and some pseudoscience that I'm talking about here. This is 147% factual. So everyone should know that. So order the tea, the Jocko White tea. Also, you can order a, a, a new book, which is called Way of the Warrior Kid. And I got asked why I wrote this the other day. And one of the things that propelled me to write this book was I was looking for a book when my son was a little younger. I was looking for a book for a boy to read. Let's mm -hmm. get a book. And so, you know, I wanted him to read kind of a book, right? right? Kind of a book about getting after it, right? So I went out sure. and I looked through a couple books and I finally found this pirate book. And I got a cool pirate book. I didn't pay too much attention. I didn't like look through it because it's a pirate book, right? Pirates mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. swords, yeah, man. Sword. ships taking over, right? Go storming vessels All good at things. sea. So go into the book. I bring, bring it home to my son. We start reading bo the book. And um, they were weak. And so now I'm like trying to get my son, you know, Fired up and in the game and he's reading about weak pirates. They weren't they didn't even attack anybody, Dang, right? Yeah. Can't do it. So I realize that there's a dearth of books for children, not just boys, but boys and girls. 
that will show someone how to get after it at a young age, right? Which mm. you can start getting after it at birth, by the way. There's no reason to wait. <laughs> There's no legal minimum age. You don't have to be 18. Yeah. Oh, can I see your get, get after it license, your yeah. get after it ID card? No, you can start getting at, after it at birth. That's so true. So that's one of the reasons that I wrote a book about a kid who's not going to be a pansy and not going to be wimpy. He actually is in the beginning. He's feeling pretty weak. You know how many pull-ups he can do? How many? Zero pull-ups. It's not good. You know, you know what he's. You know, you know how well he knows his times tables. How well? He doesn't know them. Doesn't know his times tables. That's weak. <laughs> and guess what? Can he swim? No, can't swim. And last thing, is he getting picked on? Yeah, Kenny Williamson. Kenny Williamson, the bully. He's all up on him, pushing him around. He can't stand up to him, doesn't know what to do. So, is that a good way to go through life? I don't know, you tell me. Zero pull-ups, do you wanna be able to do zero pull-ups? Echo, no. Leif? No. no, not good. Gotta be able to do some pull-ups. Yeah, yeah. So, that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. So that the kid out there that can't do any pull-ups, maybe he's getting picked on, maybe, maybe he can't swim, but maybe there's some other thing in his life that he, I mean, we all got issues, right. you know, we all got something yeah. we gotta overcome. Right. We all got fear to overcome. Guess what? We talk about fear in the book because everyone, Leif was talking about it today. We all get afraid. How are you going to overcome that? It's true. Well, luckily for Mark in the book, his Uncle Jake shows up. Uncle Jake was in the SEAL teams. He's got some lessons to teach to young Mark, and that's what he does. So you can pre order it right now. Way of the Warrior Kid. And you know what? We got to make some t shirts on that one. Yeah. Kids t shirts. Yeah, the few parts that you did tell me, it's even you explaining, like, that's a good little explanation of it, and it's good. But the little parts that you were telling me were, were kind of impressive. Like, <laughs> there was, that's kind of advanced for a kid's book even, you know, in a good way. Yeah. Meaning, like, it's not, you know, there's certain obvious things that you, you, you know you're going to find in a kid's book. Right. Even with stories like this, it's like, okay, I know the narrative, yeah, I get it. it get and it. it has to be that way to, you know, to teach the lesson effect of all this stuff. But the little hints of com complexity, they were impressive, I got to say. The other thing that is, even when I read it right, right now, just finished final edits, and you're like, th there's so much in there that's actually from the podcast, mm. but it's for a kid. It's put yeah. in a kid's language. Yeah. Uncle Jake's breaking it down real simple. So that's why that's why I don't care who you are. You, you yeah. want that broken down. That's you a know? law of combat in the book Extreme Ownership written mm. by Leif Babbitt and myself. <laughs> Gotta keep things simple. Mm. So it's in a simple way. So that's Way the Warrior Kid. And also, by the way, just released another book. Mm -hmm. It's called Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. And this is the this is the ebook that I talked about here a long time ago. I'm gonna write an ebook. Right. Well, it turned into a real book, and it's broken into two parts. One part is called thoughts. The other part is called actions. These are actually my thoughts and my actions. So okay. what are thoughts? Well, what do I think about what's going on? What do I think about when you run up against weakness? What do you think? Those are the thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then actions is, okay, how do you act? Which means workouts are in there, which means talks about martial arts, talks about what I eat, how I sleep, and that kind of stuff. So pre-order it, check it out, and it will help them logistically when the book comes out. Because, see the publishers? They don't understand what we're doing here. They, they don't know what we're doing here. They don't know, and when I'm talking about we, I'm not talking about you and me, I'm not talking about we, I'm talking about we. Yeah, yeah. They don't understand what we're doing here. They don't understand that there's troopers that want to get after it. <laughs> nope. So when they don't understand that, they're like, okay, well, you know, I guess we'll print, um, I guess we'll print you know, 400 copies of this, and that way, you know, yeah, someone can buy it. Right. Like, the, they don't the know. The formula is good. They don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. So, pre-order so that they understand what we are doing here. Maybe we'll get some of them in the game, actually. Okay, so that's that. And, you know, Speaking of books, Leif, I always talk about a little book called Extreme Ownership. What are you hearing from the field on Extreme Ownership right now? The book that we wrote. 
I'm uh, I'm hearing a lot from the field on extreme ownership. I mean, what's what's awesome to me about extreme ownership is just continues to resonate with people, you know. And uh, even you know, we're we're over a year and a half out of publication now, um, and that this thing continues to be in the top, you know, 150 or 200 on on Amazon. Uh, and so much of that is word of mouth driven, you know, that people are buying that for their team, you know, and, and holding. Well, well, wait, wait a minute. Wait, well, did it help with that big ad that we put in the New York Times? Did that help sell it? Oh, wait, no, we didn't do that. <laughs> oh, maybe it's the TV spots that we did. Oh, no, we didn't do that either. So word of mouth, it is. Exactly. And, and I, you know, for that, that's the real testament, I think, for, you know. Uh, for me, that uh, that we wrote a book that's resonant with leaders, that's helping them get better, to lead better teams, for people to to be better teammates and employ these concepts in extreme ownership. You know, when we see the uh, you know the the uh, the fire service training that's going on, you know, and, and face firefighters are using that as their their training manual, conducting these these training. Or we see police uh, police units doing it. We see. Uh, businesses, you know, and some of them bring us in and have training. Some of them they're holding their own training and they're buying that book and they're uh, they're they're learning out of it. Uh, I was working with a business just uh, just a couple of weeks back where they, you know, each each group in this uh, uh, leadership team was assigned to study a chapter and talk about how what in that chapter applies to them and they're 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 learning out of that and it's inspiring to see that stuff because not only is it is it. You know, does it say, hey, we wrote a book that's having some impact, but when you see the things that they're doing, when they're implementing extreme ownership, when they're using cover move, and they're not focused on themselves, but about the mission and working together as a team and, and using decentralized command, you know, explaining the why to their teams, um, and and the results are amazing, you know, see that happen. And, uh, and that's really, uh, you know, that's really what it's all about for us, I think, is, is seeing that kind of impact. So uh, it's been awesome to see that. Um, and uh, looking forward for that uh, to continue to, to grow and expand its reach across the globe. You, you know, you, we, we talk about in the book, we talk about working with Iraqi soldiers, and one of the hardest things, obviously, even if you took a great soldier, but they don't speak the language you speak and you have a language barrier, that's a real problem. So a lot of times in these teams, what the book gives them, what the extreme ownership gives them, it gives them a a language, a common language to talk about the issues, the leadership problems that they're having, they can identify. Because how can you fight an enemy that you can't identify? So if you know, if you don't know that, hey, our decentralized command is weak, and if you don't know what that is and you can't identify it, how can you fix it? If you got to cover and move to solve problems and work together, but you don't know what that looks like or you don't even know what to call it, how are you going to get it solved? So that's one of the things that I notice when we show up at a company that already is is using it and have read it they're immediately saying you know hey this is the this is the situation we got we got these divisions over here and this division over here and we're not covering moving for each other we we got to identify and you go okay so they've already got a grip on it when people that we go and talk to they they haven't read the book yet they can't even really identify what's wrong they just don't see it they don't have the the ability it's like not having night vision they just they just don't see it so the book when you get that book out there to everyone on your team and all of a sudden they all have that common language, they all can identify targets, they know what the bad guys look like, and they know how to fix it. Yeah. And that's that's what I notice that's awesome about when we work with these companies and they're and they're in the game big time. And then the the muster. May fourth and fifth, New York City. Go to extremeownership.com, sign up now. Like I said before, I think this thing is probably gonna sell out. So if you want tickets, if you wanna be there, if you wanna be a part of this badass event. That we just we were talking about it, just this amazing group of people of us leaders and aspiring leaders to get in the game. Sign up now, extremeownership.com. I will not get be there. doing a speech. For the record, just so you know, everyone, Echo doesn't think he's going to give a speech. We think he probably should. How about a side speech? No speech. I give those all the time. Side e speeches. Echo. Echo was. Echo was a very laid back. You know the the. The good, the good island attitude. When we put him up on stage for the muster, he was not happy about that. that no, I was, I was, and that was just to say thanks. Yeah, you went in your shell. No, nah, man, I got it. You're welcome. Hey, you know, <laughs> on with the show. So you know what we you gotta we talk about. You gotta focus on your weaknesses, right? So I, I think you need to present at least for a couple of hours on the stage. <laughs> so I gotta talk about this hours. one thing because it just happened again. So mm -hmm. Echo's got this thing where he goes into this alternate voice at the end of some sentences, and I noticed in one of the last podcasts that I actually started doing it too. So really? everyone has been saying, "Hey, Jocko, what have you gotten from Echo?" Well, I think the one thing that I could say I definitely got from Echo is doing this thing right here. <laughs> 
because that's what he did. He just did it. He just did it. So pay attention to that. I don't know. What, you know what I call that? I'm going to call that the echo voice escalation. Yeah, man. So you just talking normal, and then all of a sudden you go into that echo voice escalation. <laughs> so uh, that you got your own thing now. It's effective. It's effective. <laughs> See? See how you do that? That one. That one. Almost. A before the muster, until the muster. If you want to uh, give us feedbacks or comments or whatever, you want to continue this conversation, you, you can actually find us, not hard to find, you can find us on the interwebs. <laughs> uh, Twitter, Instagrammy, and of course, of course you're gonna find us on that Facebook, boy. We gotta be there, that one. Leif is at Leif Babin. Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. Echo, do you have anything else to add right now? (laughs) No, man. Oh, yeah, actually, I do. And I heard you mention this before where you're talking about in Ramadi where, you know, the sun comes up and you say you hear the call to prayer. I know what that is, but what, what what does that sound like? What is the call to prayer? You know what? Is it a person? Like on a It is a person. It's a, it's a person on a loudspeaker, right? So oh, it, yeah, yeah. each mosque has a minaret which is a tower mm-hmm. um, and they generally have a loudspeaker mm-hmm. and uh, and so you've got uh, I forget what you, the title is in the um, in the Islamic world there's a, there's a specific title for the the prayer caller that's going to get up and, yeah, and yeah. sing sing this prayer. Um, but yeah, you just hear these speakers going off all over the city. And it's like know? a chant yeah. kind of kind of Yeah, they they it's a they they sing you know, they're, yeah, they're singing. It's a song. Oh, dang. Okay. It's, uh, so it's something that, you know, when you hear that, you know, like, the, the so there'll be one early in the morning, so, yeah. like, before the sun comes up, and we had to be in place. You know, you're going you're going in enemy territory. You had to be in the building, locked down, ready to go, because as soon as the call to prayer goes down, you know that the city's going to start awakening. Right, you know, right, People right. are going to start, you know, coming out of their houses and cars starting up and people moving around, and, and the sun's going to come up, you know, pretty soon. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's, there's five of those throughout the day. Um, and, uh, you know, that would be the, you have to hear that, that morning call, the prayer was like, mm-hmm. we're going to get some, yeah, cause yeah, the, yeah. the enemy, the enemy in Ramadi for the most part didn't operate at nighttime because we had all the advantages of night vision and yeah, everything yeah. else. So they operated during the day. So mm-hmm. the indicator that the day was starting is the first morning call to prayer. Yeah. And when you'd hear it, you'd know, man, that's so crazy how it's like, it's like this official beginning of a day, you know, the call, that's like the official Fucking commencement of the day, <laughs> isn't that crazy? I guess you could think it's crazy. I mean, we have that individually, you know, your alarm clock or your whatever. But like for everybody, yeah, it's no, crazy. It's, it's, uh, that's what that's one of the things that makes it so uh, so crazy is yeah. that it's it is the whole city every day. You know, because like one actually, this was funny. At one point, they said, "Hey, you weren't allowed." Then the way they said we weren't allowed to go within a block of a, of a mosque or something like that. And there's so many mosques in Ramadi. Yeah. You, we just showed him a map and we're like, okay, so you don't want us to do anything because if we can't go <laughs> yeah. within two blocks of a mosque or whatever the rule that they try to throw at us, yeah. you know, said, so you don't want us to do anything else on yeah. this deployment because here's a mosque, here's a mosque, here's a mosque, here's a mosque. And by the way, Intel says this mosque is okay, local mosque. Intel says this one's bad, this one's bad, this one's good. So we had, you know, different, yeah, different, um, you know, because just because someone's the mosque, some of the, some of the neighbors are saying, "Oh, great, it's called a prayer. We're ready to start a beautiful day." Yeah. Some of the people, the the smaller group of people, was saying, "Oh, here's the call to prayer. Let's go and attack Americans and and torture the local populace." So, and unfortunately, because uh, the mosques were protected and we had to get massive approvals all the way up to like the highest levels yeah. to be able to enter enter the mosque. Uh, the, the bad guys knew that and they'd use those mosques to to stage attacks out of um, You know and they they'd stockpile weapons and ammunition and 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 that stuff there. So uh, the bad guys figured out it was uh, It was not good it's crazy man. It's crazy the little details though You know what I mean that I I mean I always hear from like you guys just a little detail stuff that you don't necessarily think about You only think about oh, yeah, the, the, the gun fights and like all this stuff But just those little details kind of makes it real man. It's crazy. Any other questions? Echo Charles or comments? No. <laughs> Sorry. Very good to see Leif again. That's it. Good. Leif, you got anything else, brother? Yeah, just great to be back on here with you guys again. You know, it's it's awesome uh, uh, thinking back to the you know podcast eleven. You know, I was the first guest uh, and just getting this thing up and running. You know, and and to see the reach that it's 
uh, that it's had, uh, you know, as as the expansion and uh, you know, and where we're sitting today, you know, versus where it was then. Um, you know, the third time I'm back on, it's pretty pretty awesome, pretty awesome to see that. And I've so many people. I've, I've been sitting in jujitsu classes before. And, Someone hears me talk, and like, what, are, are you Leif Bat? <laughs> I, I guess, I guess it's the, yeah, the yeah. raspy voice is, uh, is is giving me away. But they're like, I started training jujitsu because the Jocko podcast, and I've, I've had that happen multiple times. Um, you know, uh, whether in jujitsu class or meeting someone, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 randomly in an airport or those kind of things. And um, it's just awesome. It's awesome to see troopers all over the world, uh, you know, all over the all over the place getting after it. Uh, you know, through and. and loyal listeners to Jocko Pagas and passing it on to others. I uh, Echo asked me that because a lot, we, we get a lot of people that on social media they say hey I just enlisted in the army I just listened to the Marine Corps I'm going to OCS a lot of people you know thanks for you know bu- pushing me that way or whatever and Echo says you know like hey do you think like, how many people do you think have actually joined the military because of the podcast and I said you know I, I don't know what that number looks like but there's the amount of people that have started jujitsu because of the podcast <laughs> is a big number. Yeah. It's a big number, which is awesome because obviously uh, is. jujitsu but is really good for I you. I think the number of people joining the military is probably substantial as well. In fact, I was just talking to a, a young lady last night at the event we were speaking at um, who came up to me and said, hey, I'm thinking about joining the Navy. And uh, you know, I had said she just started listening to the Jocko podcast. I think those are very much related. I told her to go buy a copy of Extreme Ownership and uh, you know, to... Uh, uh, to learn from that and take ownership of everything in the world, she was going to do well. So That's awesome. she was uh, she was an EMT and uh, yeah, wanted, wanted to be cool. a, a Navy corpsman. So I think so many people from all walks of life influenced for good by the Jocko yeah, it's, podcast. So. Thanks. It's it's uh, definitely 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 awesome for us to be a part of it and get all that feedback all the time. And and of course, there's no coincidence to the fact that you were the first guest on here, obviously. I just did an echo escalation. <laughs> that was that was a good totally one. Totally was. You know? yeah, yeah. I echo, think you, I, you have an influence in the world. I like yeah, that. yeah, that's finally, finally. In life. I hope I hope there's not someone out there that doesn't like it and blames you and then goes on a crazy like stalker mission to eliminate you from the world. Yeah, <laughs> dang. No. Luckily, he's pretty good at jujitsu, so I think he can take care of yeah, him. Yeah, and he's yeah. got a lot of knives and hatchets. So <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Any other closers? Yeah, you know what? I was just thinking. Um, we were having that conversation yesterday, you know, and uh, uh, as a dad of young kids, you know, I've got a, I've got a toddler and a baby, um, and uh, you know, I know Echo, you got Same you boat. got young kids as well, um, and uh, you know, just thinking about it can be all you parents out there know what I'm talking about, right? It can be exhausting. You know, we've gone through a time; it's winter time. You got kids who've got colds and they're sick and they're waking up multiple times a night, cutting into my my 4:45 club workouts, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's it's easy to like, it's easy, you know, when my I, my little baby girl crawls around the floor, she just s- tries to eat everything, you know, picks up the choking hazards and <laughs> and and shoves them around. Like, and you got to keep an eye on them constantly, you know. And my son is just a wild man. He's just he'll he'll just no fear of anything. He's just, I'm learning that he's just like me, and I really realize what my parents actually put up with. But he takes off running for the most dangerous thing within a mile radius, uh, and and he just like without looking back and without heeding any warning or, or command to stop from me whatsoever. So so it's it is full time, and I'm in the game all the time, and it can be exhausting. You know, it can be um, it's something that uh, you can think, oh man, I, I just can't wait till they get a little bit older, and I don't have to. You know, I can tell him to stop, or he knows not to run in the street, or my daughter's not choking on some something. She you know, and uh, and, and the reality is, you know, just being out here with Jocko and, and seeing his kids, you know, and your oldest daughter's about to graduate now from, from high school, which is amazing to me. Because when I left, you know, San Diego here, uh, your, your, your kids, they were kids. They were little, you know, and to watch them grow up into teenagers now. And, you know, when we first met, we started working together with Tassie and the Bruiser. They were really little. You know, uh, your youngest hadn't even been born and mm-hmm. your son was just a, uh, I mean, just a baby. Uh, yeah, it's like two or three years yeah, old. Yeah, and and so I just re- I realize it doesn't seem like I left the Navy that long ago. You know, it's it'll be six years this summer, um, and I realize that time has flown by like that. It has just gone by like that, and uh, and so seeing that, you know, and seeing your kids now, I. I I got to take a step back. The detachment that we always talk about, right? To be able to see with a bigger perspective and to think these moments, right? They they're awesome, and I yeah, I got to relish every nanosecond of them because my kids are going to grow up 
and they're going to be teenagers, and they're going to graduate from high school, and they're going to go off. Uh, and I got to rest, you know, for me and my wife, um, we got to cherish those moments. And people tell you that, you know, yep. and you, but you you still don't yeah. even like embrace it, you know. You still like, oh, I, if I can just get to this level. You're so, worried about the diaper, the dirty <laughs> diaper, and the <laughs> applesauce on the exactly, floor. Exactly, you know, and uh, or or you know, my kid just went through my drawer and threw everything out. And now I got to clean that up, and we're trying to get out the door. So, I think. For me, it's a great recognition of like that those moments are fleeting and they're precious and uh, you got to enjoy every second of that. So for you parents out there listening to this, um, if you're in that boat with, 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 with me, detach. Take a step back. Think about how wonderful those moments are um, and, uh, and just, just relish it. Relish every, every moment and uh, don't let yourself get flustered. Don't let yourself uh, get overwhelmed. Um, if your kid's getting up at four thirty in the morning, maybe it's time to back it up to uh, zero three hundred club. <laughs> but uh, embrace every every second of that as as a parent and uh, and cherish those moments because those are the most important things of all. Brad, I'll give you a, not you. I'll give a small tip that helped me with that. You know when like certain things get overwhelming. You're, you're trying to do this and they're crying, and then the other one's doing something, and you're like, you kind of want to yell at them, and be like, hey, I need a minute or something. But they're like kids are like a minute like what does that even mean kind of thing they don't know so the tip there is anytime you feel it bubbling up like you're getting frustrated understand that you're at that moment making it about yourself and it's not about yourself you know it's about the whether you, and you can look at it i'm going to make it about the mission or i'm going to make it about these kids make it about something other than yourself and you won't be frustrated anymore i'm telling you anytime anytime you're like oh i've been up all night this baby's been crying away. You're just making it about yourself right now. Oh, you. Oh, you. You poor parent, you know. Meanwhile, everyone, you know how many parents have been through the exact same thing? You're For making sure. it about yourself right now. You're feeling sorry or whatever, you know. Just don't make it about yourself. And know that that's what you're doing if you feel that. And then it's solved. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Check the ego. It's not yeah, about essentially, you. Essentially, yeah. It's about the mission. Yeah, exactly. It's not about you right now. That's a good one. Yeah, that's great. Great advice, Leif. And uh, as I haven't seen my kids grow up and see them about to leave the nest, as they say. Yeah. Embrace that whole time. And thanks, obviously, for coming on again. I'm sure this won't be the last time. And we'll, we'll do it again. And everyone else out there that's listening, thank you all, especially, especially the military personnel across the globe right now. By the way, they're not getting to enjoy those moments with their family. They're out there in harm's way, standing the watch for us. So thank you to all of you, to the police and law enforcement. Stay proactive and aggressive in your fight against crime and stay safe out in the streets and thank you all for keeping our streets safe and the firefighters and the EMTs and again who we call and we thank only when we need you thanks for being there waiting to help us when we need it and to the rest of you out there doing what you're doing as you go out there and do it, don't do it easy. Don't take it easy. And if someone says to you, take it easy. Tell them no. Tell them you aren't going to take it easy. Tell them you're going to go hard, as hard as you can. Tell them you're going to push and grind and fight and work as hard as you can until you have nothing left. And then turn around and walk away from that person and go do just that and do it hard. And so until next time, this is Leif and Echo and Jocko. Out.